My first involvement was when I met Prabhupada in England, in Bury Place. I was a very young, very new devotee. And I was all freshened up, ready to go into the evening arctic. And Prabhupada wanted to see me. So I went up to his room. I was feeling very, very nervous. And Prabhupada says, I want you to go to Brindavan to help build a temple. We want to build a Krishna Balaram temple. So I went with a devotee called Smarahari. We came to India on a one-way ticket. We arrived in Brindavan. Smarahari went to Mayapur to serve there. I stayed on in Brindavan. And things were very slow in the beginning. There were no funds. There was not even a concept for the temple. No design. And, of course, the key ingredient, no cement. <laughs> so you'd think, well, how is it going to happen? How is Krishna going to help us fulfill Prabhupada's desire? So Guru Kripa Maharaj, he was given the task of going to Japan with his collecting party, the Nam Hatta. And they would work very, very, very hard and bring a lot of money back to Prabhupada. And that was the beginning of real progress in the building of the Krishna Balaram Mandir. As the opening was approaching, Prabhupada was on top of every detail that was going on. And he put what he considered all his best men in charge of all the different areas. They were all his GBCs. And they were all the different administrators at that temple in charge of prasadam distribution, greeting guests, cleaning the temple, whatever it was. They were just his assistants. And of course, this was Vrindavan. So Prabhupada wanted everything done first class. And I remember him ringing the bell so many times uh, during the day to get this GBC, get this one, get that one, going back, and he would be checking up to make sure that they were doing everything properly and even receiving all of his disciples. There was nothing that escaped Prabhupada's vision, his perception. I remember him saying that all the devotees, you know, they have to have nice facility to stay. They should have this to eat. They have to have cow's milk, not buffalo milk. I mean, every detail Prabhupada covered. It wasn't just the installation ceremony. That also, he was taking care of that. But it was all the different details. He was always giving us the guidance. But it was clear that Vrindavan was his temple. He wanted to make that statement. It was very important that everything was done properly in Vrindavan. We had gotten local Brahmins to install the deities because Prabhupada said that without them doing it, people wouldn't think the deities were really installed. But this is Prabhupada at the installation. So at one point in the ceremony, they had to bring Prabhupada out. I guess he was the Yajamana, the sponsor of the sacrifice. And he had to participate in some of the rituals. You just notice how Prabhupada sits here quite, uh, I don't know what to say, submissively enduring the ritual of the brahmanas. He also ordered that there would be a 24-hour kirtan, and he told the devotees that the kirtan is actually installing the deities. But they're quite elaborate, uh, the rituals. You see how they do their coconuts up the real style. Prajumna was busy taking notes. I've never seen a person um, draw something without having to erase anything. And I remember him, Surabi, he had these pencils in his pocket. And he said to me one morning, Gunanava, he says, I'm going to do the artist's conception. I'm going to draw the Krishna Balaram Mandir for the first time. I remember we were staying in these little straw-roofed huts, very, very humble dwellings. And he had a desk and a drawing board, and had an A3 sketch pad. And he opened it up and he started sketching. And his pencil never stopped. He didn't rub anything out, and it just manifested on this paper. And when he showed Srila Prabhupada that design, Srila Prabhupada beamed. 
I was in the room, Srila Prabhupada said, this is wonderful. And he was so proud of it, and he was showing some guests that were also there in the room. He said, oh, this is going to be the Krishna Balaram Mandir. Prabhupada was responsible for everything, and he pushed everyone to do as much as they could do, and, and sometimes beyond our own limits. And I remember Sarabi, who was, you know, in, in charge of it all, had to undergo a lot of chastisement. I would be getting Sarabi so many times uh, towards the end of it, the last week, and I don't know how much sleep he was getting. I know it wasn't very much. My Prabhupada would say, call Sarabi, and he would tell him that this was wrong and that was wrong, and it was very intense. In all those two years that all these temples were built, two or three years, uh, there was always this pressure on time. It had to be done quickly. Everything had to be done so fast. And there was always delays. And that was a, a kind of a disappointment. I really did my best. I tried my best. And I think at times there was like an ego thing in me that I would feel that it couldn't be faster, but I could see that Prabhupada disagreed with me. And these were like moments that you probably make a lot of spiritual advancement because you really got to face yourself. You're going to accept the fact that no, it is too slow. Even though I could have had millions of reasons why, including there was no money, including the electricity went down, there were blackouts, whatever I would come up with. It just would not register and Prabhupada, he would not accept that. It was like, now I have to surrender. So this was like my battle of surrender. It was always like, there is a way to do it faster. And then you have to find that out. And I remember when all the deities were standing, um, they weren't on the altar yet, they were on the ground with their blindfolds on and there was this, um, opulent sort of hut built in the in the courtyard with fruits and coconuts and this whole thing and Srila Prabhupada was over talking to the a few Brahmins I think that were over on the side and I'll never forget this this vision he was um, it was as though he was uh, calling on Krishna to come and enter into the forms of the deities and there was this stream of light just coming down and his hands were up like this and the other people were just standing there with their palms folded and and he was saying something I couldn't hear him because I was on the other side but I saw that that beautiful vision and then they continued with the installation of the deities I went to Jaipur where the deities were being carved and I supervised the carving of the deities, especially the Prabhupada, because the, the carvers, they were working from photographs, often not very good. And so the man who was carving Prabhupada was having a really hard time. He, he was so frustrated because I kept trying to show him things and point out certain things on the photograph of Prabhupada. And they had to actually redo the whole carving at one point because uh, some spot came up on Prabhupada's head. The sculptor finally said, now you do it, and he left. Because <laughs> I watched him, so I kind of started learning a little bit. So I took over for a little while. Finally, the day came when all the deities were finished. And uh, I brought the deities to Vrindavan on a train, and then a tanga, and then I took a rickshaw. This was like early in the morning. 3 a.m. or something. Just as I started entering the outskirts of Vrindavan, with all the deities in their crates, all the peacocks started crying. The hair on my head stood up from that sound. It was, it was an amazing experience. Nothing would stand in Prabhupada's way. This temple had to open as soon as possible. And, and there were many obstructions. You live in Brindavan, you try and get things done. Everything's magnified a hundred times. 
So if there's an obstruction, it's a big one. It's a hundred times more obstructive than anywhere else in the world. But finally, um, through great endeavor, the day arrived. M. Chanareddy was the governor of Uttar Pradesh. He comes from Andhra Pradesh originally, and Prabhupada had some contacts with him. He was also a life member. Prabhupada had very specifically invited him. That was very important to Srila Prabhupada, that the governor come for the opening. And he was establishing the credibility of our movement. And Prabhupada was such a gracious host that even though he was very sick at that time, Prabhupada somehow or other completely uh, shed all of his illness and was acting in every way as if he had had absolutely no illness. And then later in the evening he was not well again. But Prabhupada would just completely ignore his physical condition. The first Artik was going to take place and I was in the temple room and the temple room was packed with people. And you know how it is in India, everyone was shoving each other one way. Uh, it was like an ocean of people just going from one direction to the other and somehow or other I found myself right in the middle and the curtains opened. I had no idea that Prabhupada was going to offer the first Artik. And it was so wonderful just watching Srila Prabhupada as he was offering the articles. He was offering them with such love and simplicity. When the curtains opened up, I was right in front of the Krishna Balaram altar. And I was so filled with Ananda, just thinking of the, the triumph of Prabhupada and all that went into it. So just thinking of that, tears were just pouring out of my eyes. And I just wanted to stand there and watch Prabhupada in his moment of glory <laughs> and relish it. There was just one person between me and a clear view of Srila Prabhupada, and that was Sriparari Swami. So I was standing behind him, and I did everything I could think of. I held my camera in front of him. I tapped him on the shoulder. But he was just fixated on Prabhupada offering the arti. Vishaka wanted to take a picture, and I was blocking the view. <laughs> and so she's tapping me on the shoulder, which, you know, a lady wouldn't normally do that in ISKCON. And I was at the sannyasi at the time, on top of the new sannyasi. And, you know, I was hearing her, but I wasn't listening. He remained fixed in his position, and in fact just ignored me. So I became a little bit desperate, and I put my mouth next to his ear because the kirtan was very loud. And I said loudly, if you stand there, then you can see Srila Prabhupada offering the arti. But if you let me stand there, then the whole world will see Srila Prabhupada offering the arti. So she got to me and I, I stepped out of the way and she took a very famous picture. Jaya Radhe Jaya There's one part towards the end of the Arctic, he's offering um, the peacock fan. And as he looks out to offer it to the devotees, the smile on his face is unbelievable. It was like one who'd conquered the earth. He'd done it. He'd installed Krishna and Balaram in Vrindavan and you could just read his face. It was full of bliss, full of happiness. When Srila Prabhupada gave the lecture on the day of their installation, he gave the lecture in Hindi, so it would have been directed to the local guests. And he was begging forgiveness from all the personalities there for any offenses. And that, that struck me. There were days of, of speeches by different God brothers and learned men of Vrindavan. In particular, I remember there was one speech given by Nisringabhalabha Goswami, where Nisringabhalabha Goswami gave extensive scriptural evidence of how persons who were not members of the Vedic culture 
could be elevated to the platform of Brahmins and Vaishnavas. And Prabhupada was quite pleased with that speech. It was given in Hindi, but Prabhupada gave a summary afterwards. And the other thing I'll never forget is the quantity of pink rose petals. And there was this like abundance of pink rose petals that you were actually kind of up to our ankles on the floor. It was so special. After Mangalati, we're all making garlands for Krishna and Balaram. And one day there were lots of broken flowers left that couldn't be used for the garlands. So I had them all in this sheet that we'd been using on top of the floor to make them in. And I took them and I showered them over Srila Prabhupada from the balcony in the guest house. And then he gave this instruction that we shouldn't waste the flowers. Srila Prabhupada was very conscious in India, particularly, of wasting the money. He knew how to protect the flowers so they'd stay fresh for longer. He told us to wrap them in damp cloths and hang them in a cold place. He knew everything about flowers, it seemed to us. But also he didn't want us to waste. Even though, practically speaking, the flowers couldn't be used, he still wanted to teach us not to waste. And he considered that showering flowers on him like the demigods in the heavenly planets a waste of flowers. So I never did that again. The Brindavan project was actually the very first real temple in ISKCON. This established Prabhupada so much in Brindavan. I think he, uh, he felt very good about that. Because actually Bombay was started earlier, but it was stopped because of the, the court cases. And I think at that time he was trying to get Bombay first. And then everything was blocked there. And Mayapur was a long-term project. It wasn't so urgent. And then Brindavan became priority. So it only took about two years to build Brindavan, less than two years. Most ashrams and temples, they went very slow. When money came there, they would build something. And ours went very fast, very quickly done. And that was the same in Bombay, actually. Of course, Brindaban had beautiful buildings, very classic buildings, but the standards were not very high in most of them. They were sort of run down a little bit. They were dark inside, and they, they didn't have much life, actually. And then this one was just so clean and fresh and lively, and there was just, everything was beautiful in there. And that's what people felt also when they would come to the temple. It sort of woke up Brindavan. There was a parade, quite an elaborate procession through the streets of Vrindavan. Uh, there was an elephant, there was a Shanai band, and all the devotees doing kirtan. It was quite, uh, quite a commotion with all of this procession going through. Prabhupada seemed to be very beaming and happy. He was walking at the head of the procession, <laughs> and, uh, which now that I think of it, it must have been quite funny for people who knew him from before. And here he is with an elephant, a Shanai band, and all these Western disciples walking through <laughs> the streets where he had walked so many times as a sadhu. And um, we walked quite a ways. It seemed like a very, very long walk through the city. The procession, it was like something out of the Bhagavatam. Decorated cows and bulls, brass bands, drums, kirtan parties, thousands of people. Residents came out of their homes, their businesses, as Prabhupada walked by offering him water, flowers, and similar gifts. I remember that day I heard that Prabhupada wasn't well. The devotees wanted him to sit on a palanquin. It was a very long procession, but he refused. He walked the whole way. They had a, a Roth, because that's the tradition. There's a Roth, and the spiritual master rides on the Roth, and then there's a procession. And there were hundreds of devotees. And at one point, Prabhupada decided he wanted to get off the Roth and walk with us. So when he did that, everyone just wanted to come and touch Prabhupada's feet at the same time, especially the Indian-bodied people who had come to the festival. So immediately, I think it was Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he was there. He organized us into human chains. We locked arms on either side of Prabhupada. So we went 
along the procession like that, keeping people from, you know, crushing Prabhupada. During that procession, at times we would be farther away from Prabhupada, and at times we would be, we would be closer to Prabhupada. The farther away you got from Prabhupada, it was like being in a hurricane. It was just chaos. And, and as we came closer to Prabhupada, it got calmer and calmer and calmer until when we were right next to Prabhupada, it was like we were in the eye of a hurricane. I mean, it was so calm and serene, and Prabhupada was just emanating this ecstasy. And it was a stark realization, the consciousness that the empowered pure devotee had. He could change the atmosphere, not just in a room where everything was organized perfectly, but he could change the atmosphere anywhere. Prabhupada designed Krishna and Balaram deities, the, the mudra, he made a drawing, gave it to Bhardraj to have it made in Jaipur. There's no Krishna Balaram deity like this, with Balaram resting his arm on Krishna's shoulders. There's no deity like that. Prabhupada made that design. And then he would joke about it. Who is stronger, Krishna or Balaram? Bala means strength, he's the strong one. And everyone would say, Balaram. And then Prabhupada said, then why Balaram is resting on Krishna? This means Krishna is stronger. So the bank was right under the guest house. That's actually where Prabhupada's room is now, where we have Bhagavad Gita class. They opened a bank, and all the devotees crowded in, and Prabhupada was inside, and he was inaugurating the bank. And he told this joke. I was craning through the little screen window to hear what he was saying. He said, so one man heard that the money attracts money. So he went into the bank and he put his money on the counter. And the teller took his money and put it in the till and said, yes, can I help you? And the man said, well, I heard that money attracts money. So I put my money there, and he said, yes, but our money has attracted your money. <laughs> and uh, Prophet laughed, and everyone laughed. <laughs> and that was his joke that he told. There was one morning walk after the installation, and the temple was beautiful. You know, it looked so beautiful. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj was there, and he said, Prabhupada, Sarabhi has really done a wonderful job. And Prabhupada he kind of chuckled, and he said, Yes, everyone is saying Sarabhi has done so nice. He said, But as all I do is chastise him. He said, But that's my duty. I'm his spiritual master. And when he said that, all, all the ideas I had about, oh, I used to think, poor Sarabhi. <laughs> yeah, you just could understand. And Prabhupada was always pushing us. And if we were able to you know, handle that and deal with it, you could make so much advancement in Krishna consciousness. Because with this pushing, always came a lot of blessings. Whatever we could do was because of Prabhupada's blessings. The next day, I was on... Prabhupada's morning walk on what was then Chattikara Road, which at that time, of course, was really just a, a dusty road through a uh, largely uninhabited, undeveloped region of Vrindavan, with woods and fields on both sides. And Prabhupada that morning was, again, very much pleased. He'd worked so hard to, to establish the temple and install the deities, and now it had it had come off. And Prabhupada recalled how he pushed the devotees. He said, I was practically whipping them. Then he began telling how Krishna was flattering Balaram. That my dear brother, all of these trees are bending down to offer you their obeisances. And these bees they're all great sages who are coming to you for your association. In that way, he began describing that pastime. And then he said how 
uh, Gornitai and Krishna Balaram are not different. There is no difference between Krishna and Balaram and Gornitai. He said, so if you ever have any difficulty, you can go before Gornitai or Krishna Balaram and say, sir, this is the problem, and they will do the needful. It was just a wonderful victory for Prabhupada, uh, the opening of the Krishna Balaram temple. A great triumph over, over many obstacles. In all of the temples in, in India, the principal temples that Prabhupada opened, Mayapur, Vrindavan, and uh, Bombay, he struggled. In, in Mayapur, he struggled with his own god brothers. Uh, in Bombay, of course, he struggled with the tenants, the municipality, and, and in Vrindavan, he struggled with the Goswamis. And, and so all of them were a great victory, but I think Vrindavan was the greatest victory, and it was the homeland of Prabhupada, as he said, you know, my, my place of worship is Mayapur, my office is Bombay, and my home is Vrindavan. So it was, a, it was a great triumph, and we all uh, felt it. And from there, he built a bridge across the whole ocean to the whole rest of the world, that people could easily walk over that and, and enter into Vrindavan. He gave life to the whole of Vrindavan, actually enthusiasm for Krishna Bhakti. Even those who had, had opposed him in some way, recognizing, yes, you're a hometown boy and you've made us famous all over the world and you've brought Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission everywhere. And it was like formally really recognized by the town of Vrindavan. I remember at the time there were six Brahmin boys that were initiated from Brahmin families in the Braj. It was a big thing for a Brahmin boy to be initiated by Prabhupada and be in a movement where they would eat chapatis cooked by persons born in the West and so forth. It was a huge triumph for Vaishnavism over religion, you know, experiential spiritual life over religion, Vaishnavism over Brahmanism. One of the causes that Prabhupada championed his whole life. We were on the list for a second initiation in Vrindavan. So that was very exciting, because the first initiation that we had in Los Angeles, Srila Prabhupada wasn't able to be there, and we were initiated by uh, his older disciples on his behalf at the time. But this time we were getting personally second initiation from Srila Prabhupada, so that was very exciting. We had the ceremony, and then we lined up outside his quarters and were to go in one by one to get the Gayatri Mantra. I didn't have a lot of money at the time, so I didn't really have any money to offer. So I went and got a big papaya. I thought, well, this I'll offer him a fruit that he can have for breakfast or something. <laughs> and uh, I remember going in. I offered my obeisances, and I was just extremely nervous. Didn't know what, what I was supposed to say or anything. I just said, Jai Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> And then he, he was sitting on the other side of his desk with his knee propped up. Uh, it was very warm, already in April. And he had on his uh, sannyasi top. And uh, he patted the floor beside him, sort of like saying, come on over here, you know, like calling his little dog. <laughs> so I went scampering over and was sitting right next to him. And uh, I remember being really nervous, but I wanted to be sure that I pronounced the Sanskrit nicely. Maybe I was even a little proud because Jayadweta once had told me that my pronunciation was very nice in Sanskrit, probably from my German background. So um, he would point to one word after the other and I would repeat, and I was trying to do it really nice. You know, I have to like impress my teacher. <laughs> I felt so foolish and arrogant and foolish all at the same time. <laughs> Then he says, do you know how to count? And I said, yes, I've been watching the devotees for the past years doing their Gayatri. And I thought, gee, I should really have an intelligent question to ask. But of course, I couldn't think of anything. I was just sort of dumbfounded. But um, I just remember feeling so much kindness and, um, and love. Just so simple and... Uh, practical and just paid my obeisances and left. This is early morning after the morning program 
I was very amazed to get initiated on that day. And Prabhupada actually turned to Prabhupada and said, this boy actually is too young to be initiated. I was only nine. And he didn't say anything. So Prabhupada looked at him and says, never mind. And then he asked for the principles. And I wanted to tell Prabhupada the, the regular principles in English. I was studying them during the initiation ceremony. So I told him two of the principles in English. And the other two I got stuck. And my teacher, Prabhupada Prabhu, he was behind Prabhupada. He was trying to encourage me. He said, don't worry, tell him in Bengali, the other two. Uh, this is me. If you look carefully, I don't have a Sikha because the barber in Mayapur, a couple of days before I arrived in Vrindavan, he by mistake cut all the hair off. I didn't have any Sikha. And all the devotees have Sikha and they're making fun of me. And I look at his Mayavadi. And Bhavananda fired the barber because he forgot to save me a Sikha. So anyway, Prabhupada didn't mind. He didn't say anything. And Prabhupada was quite pleased at that time. He saw in my face that I was trying to tell him um, the regular principles in English to please him. And he smiled and then he gave me the beats. The installation of the deities was in Ram Nomi. And then the initiation ceremony took place on Balaram's Ras Purnima, uh, April 21st, which was five or six days later. After the Hyderabad Pandal, we were headed from Hyderabad to the opening of the Krishna Balaram Mandir. And a whole bogey was reserved for the devotees, so it was all just devotees in the train. And there was one Indian sadhu sitting on his suitcase by the bathroom. And he didn't really mix with any of the other devotees. Mostly they were just Western devotees, a few Indian devotees, like Haridas. And I was really wondering whether he was part of our group or not. He was very quiet and very patiently sat on his suitcase by the bathroom the whole way to Vrindavan. And then during the festival, although there was a moratorium on sannyas, the devotees had gone to Srila Prabhupada and asked if Tripurari could take sannyas. And Prabhupada said yes. And they said, when? And he said, well, he can take now. So along with Tripurari, one other devotee took sannyas, and his name was Gorgovinda. And then when he was there, I saw that this is the same devotee that was sitting very quietly by the bathroom, coming from Hyderabad to Vrindavan. I was serving at the Montreal Temple, Canada. And there was a lot of devotees going to India, and before we left, I went back home to Los Angeles where my parents lived to give them a visit. And as I was leaving there, my mother asked me out of the blue, she said, is there something I can give to you to take to your spiritual master? And I was really taken aback by that question, and I went, oh, you know, that's so nice. And I said, I don't know, what would you like to give him? And she said, I could make him some guava jam, because we had fruit trees at the property. So I told her that would be really nice. And so she made the guava jam, and uh, she wrote on there for Srila Prabhupada. And when I was in Vrindavan, I went up to Srila Prabhupada's quarters and handed it through to one of his servants. And that was that. And then I found out for two days the Prabhupada's servant was looking for me. He had remembered what I looked like, but he didn't know my name. Finally he found me and he said that Srila Prabhupada really loved the jam. And he wanted my mother's name and address because Srila Prabhupada wanted to write her a thank you letter. There it was. I mean, all these devotees, huge event. You know, the opening of the temple, the installation of the deities. And Srila Prabhupada was so concerned to write a thank you letter. So my parents received a letter from Srila Prabhupada. And he was thanking my mom so nicely for this guava jam. And he told her that it was his favorite jam and that his mother used to make guava jam for him. And then he went on to say that, do not worry about your daughter. I am taking care of her. She is nicely engaged in the Lord's service. 
it was just a really sweet letter. Um, it's just so amazing that Srila Prabhupada took that time to recognize just that little gift from my mother and amongst so much activity going on and so many devotees. Well, here Prabhupada's giving Bhagavad Gita class. He actually wanted Bhagavad Gita class to be held in the courtyard. And there was one Indian joined, his name is Prem Yogi. And he told him that he should give class in Hindi every evening. Then there was also a, an Indian couple, Pranav and his wife, Vanamali. And he told him that he should also give Hindi class and his wife should sing bhajans. But then Pranav said, actually, my wife is more intelligent than me, better that she gives the class. She speaks from Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada said, that's all right. If she, if she can do that, she can give the class. Now these people here, these are students from Nepal. And Prabhupada wanted them to chant the Purusha Shukta every day. And this is the Hindi teacher. Prabhupada wanted us to learn Hindi. One morning I tried to demonstrate my Hindi. So I said, Prabhupada, I'm learning from this teacher. And he said, so what have you learned? I said, Ek Balak Jatahe, which means one boy is walking. Then Prabhupada said, you know how to say in Hindi, two boys are walking? I said, no. And then he left. He said, you'll never learn Hindi. So I took that as an instruction. This tree was a place of pilgrimage for Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Long before the Krishna Balaram Mandir was constructed in Vrindavan, in the early 1970s, there were purported to be very few Tamal trees in Vrindavan, one at Rasathali and one at the Samhadi of Rupa Goswami in Radha Damodar. So when Srila Prabhupada noted that the land had a Tamal tree on it, he was very, very pleased. There's an interesting pastime about this tree. Long before Srila Prabhupada sat under this tree, as we're witnessing in this footage, he envisioned himself sitting under this tree and looking at the deities of Krishna Balaram. He said, we'll have kirtan under this tree. And he said, this tree should be worshipped. And the soil under the tree, a, a teaspoon of it should be taken and mixed with sand and water from the Yamuna River. And then with a coconut husk, you should clean the arti paraphernalia in our temple with this holy substance. This is a very sacred place for us. And let us pray that not only now, but in the future, Srila Prabhupada's wish will be fulfilled and um, Gaudiya Vaishnavas will be able to worship this sacred tree in this sacred location for many, many more years to come. <laughs> The next step, the next key component, uh, was the establishing of the Goshama. Krishna Balaram now needs to drink milk. <laughs> Just like they did 5,000 years ago when they were herding Nanda Maharaj's 100,000 cows. So Prabhupada called me into his room and he says, I'd like you to establish a Goshala. Krishna Balaram need milk and my disciples need to maintain health and vitality. Because in those days in Vrindavan, basically the milk that we were drinking was either watered down buffalo milk or very watered down, God knows what, milk. <laughs> so that was important. So what do I do? Prabhupada has told me to start a Goshala. I didn't have any money. I didn't really know how to begin. So 
I had a Seiko watch on my wrist. And I thought, right, I'll sell my Seiko watch. And then Bagaji, uh, one older Indian gentleman that Prabhupada regarded as his right-hand man in India. And Bagaji helped me incredibly over so many years uh, in my service to Srila Prabhupada. So he took me to Govardhan market where there would be a monthly cow auction. And from the proceeds of selling my Seiko watch, I think we got about eight or nine hundred rupees in those days for it, I was able to purchase two cows. <laughs> and that's how the Goshala started. And the Goshala started simultaneously with the construction of the Gurukul, of the boys' Gurukul ashram, which also Prabhupada asked me to oversee the construction of that building. After everyone had darshan, when the deities opened in the morning for Mongol Arctic, then they went to the sort of respective altar, like the woman had Radha and Krishna, and the men were, had Krishna Balaram and uh, Gonitai. And when Mongol Arctic having darshan, and at some point I turned around, and then there was Prabhupada with two or three other devotees with him, one secretary or something. But all I know is that it was amazing to turn around and Prabhupada standing. You know how there are some steps. So he could not see very much, I suppose, being down from the steps and having the woman standing, turning our back to him, not knowing he was here, obviously. But I found out from Upendra afterwards that he was there for almost 10 minutes. Somebody was going to come to tell us to move. But when they tried to do that, Prabhupada said to just leave it. I mean, here's Prabhupada probably not seeing very much, and he just stood there with all our back to him. And had I not turned around and seen him, no one would have moved away. It touched me. Prabhupada was invited to this convention of sadhus. So we all went. Of course, the whole thing was in, in Hindi. The first order of business, out of respect for Prabhupada, they voted Prabhupada to be the president of the convention. Of course, everyone had a chance to speak, but that also meant that the president would speak last. So Prabhupada had to sit there, the Mona people, you know, who who don't speak, they use chalkboards to write, and uh, the Jains with their mouths covered, and then all the, the Mayavadis and the Yogis and Paramahansas, and I mean, everyone, they were talking, and Prabhupada, I don't know how he sat through all of this stuff. And then finally, at the end, they asked Prabhupada to speak, and Prabhupada he spoke in Hindi, but oh, you, he was so animated and he was quoting shlokas and it was, you could tell he was giving them the sauce. And from the shlokas, we could understand Bhagavatam kicks out cheating religion. <laughs> they were all quiet, they couldn't say anything. Of course, in the end, then Prabhupada said, you know, what is the use of these conventions? They talk about unity and peace, but uh, they'll never achieve it. They all have their own idea. You know, unless they surrender to Krishna, how can there be any unity? After he spoke, Prabhupada said, let's go. And right away he sat down and he said, so did you understand what I was saying? And we said, a little bit, Prabhupada. He said, yes. I told him, everyone's speaking so many things, he said, but not once did anyone mention Krishna as a speaker of Bhagavad Gita, as being the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He says that all your activities here will be useless. You won't accomplish anything. So he's still going on in the car. He was, Prabhupada was a defender of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he just told them all off. And then he got in the car and he left. And I remember on the way back, we headed back to Delhi, I guess, and there was a big typhoon and it was pouring rain and trees were blowing down in front of us and behind us. It was just like all hell broke loose, you know, after Prabhupada left this assembly.
Towards the end of the Darshan Delhi Temple, he sat next to his harmonium and played a few melodies of the Hare Krishna mantra and chanted. And then he pushed the harmonium away and he said, this is the way to please Krishna, to chant the Hare Krishna mantra in different melodies. Um, during Srimad Bhagavatam class, in that lecture he was talking about hogs, dogs, camels and asses. And my parents came to that particular lecture. And uh, my father's response after that was, he said, what kind of lecture was that? He was just talking about hogs, dogs, camels and asses. And uh, <laughs> Prabhupada gave us just what we needed to hear. But we're not always willing to accept. But it was very interesting. He was talking about Grihamedi life and hogs, dogs, camels and asses. No Radhe Radhe or intimate pastimes or anything like that. When you look back now, it's so much clearer you know, how his preaching was medicinal on, on the level that we needed to hear these things and we still need to hear these things. He's giving the right medicine, the right dose at the right time. Not like a, a quack who give you something that you like to take but doesn't actually do the job. And they're all the devotees. But you can see Prabhupada after arriving 10 hours on the plane, 12 hours, sometimes 15 hour flight, he's always fresh and spry. Navayovana, Krishna's Navayovana. So Prabhupada was the servant of the ever fresh Krishna, so he was always spry himself too. And Prabhupada's weighted down with the flowers. <laughs> there was never too many flowers. Prabhupada would distribute the flowers. And there he is, a, from material calculation, an old man walking with the young, spry, enthusiastic devotees. This was a great scene. Prabhupada felt comfortable in the, the presence of all the young, enthusiastic devotees. He didn't feel out of place. Srila Prabhupada would only come to Australia once a year, which was quite uh, good considering the remoteness of the country, but Prabhupada came to Australia six different times. This is a good picture. On the right is the temple, and on the left is the Prabhupada house. Beautiful yellow and white. We painted the whole house. Up on the top it said Prabhupada house. There's a widow's walk on the top where they could look out into the ocean. Uh, his Prabhupada walking in. This old house uh, was about 100 years old, a Victorian house, a historical house. It was the first house in the whole neighborhood that was built by a rich man. All the details about it you can get from Korma's book, The Great Transcendental Adventure, by Korma Das, the cook. The whole house was redone, and uh, we made it very elaborate, ebony wood, and the drapes and the walls and the floors were all done over and the chandelier and and uh, Prabhupada walked in and he looked around and he says, all this is for me? <laughs> and we said, yes Prabhupada, this is Prabhupada's house, your house. So we were, we were very happy. But before this time we had always been operating out of small houses and storefronts and the devotees collecting in the streets and uh, enduring a lot of different hardships, distributing Srila Prabhupada's books. So moving into this new temple and inviting people was the crowning glory of all their efforts and it, it was a, a time of great pride uh, for the devotees to showcase their spiritual master in such a, a beautiful setting and such a relaxed atmosphere. And, this marked a, a great historic time in Australia, Yatra. When Prabhupada came back and they took him up to his room, and uh, so I went up there and brought this beautiful silver bowl with these peanuts and spiced rice bubbles in it. And I came in and put it down before Prabhupada and paid my obeisances. 
And then Prabhupada took out his Gayatri thread and started chanting his Gayatri. So all the other big Brahmins in the room put out their Gayatri threads and sat there like this. And then after a very short time, Prabhupada finished chanting his Gayatri. <laughs> Everyone else still had their you know, sacred thread hooked around their thumbs. So <laughs> Prabhupada reached into this bowl of these spice rice bubbles, picked up a little bit and handed it to the nearest Brahman who <laughs> still had his thumb hooked around his kaitri thread. <laughs> and what a dilemma. So all the devotees immediately stopped chanting the kaitri, put their hands out and accepted what Prabhupada was offering them. <laughs> uh, I've later found out from Shruti Kirti's book uh, this was a fairly common occurrence that uh, Prabhupada chanted his Gayatri very quickly. So um, one by one the devotees got up and left the room and I was still sitting there alone with Prabhupada and um, he asked me what my service is. I said, Prabhupada, I, I do cooking and uh, deity worship. He said, oh, that is very nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things I think the devotees really appreciate and I talk about it a lot is you know it's seeing how or hearing how Prabhupada lived that you know we all need to see and know how Prabhupada practiced Krishna consciousness and taking prasadam was to me was just such a a wonderful activity the way he did it you can see he always took prasadam alone 99% of the time and if there was someone who was in the room and I would bring him prasadam, you know, he would just very graciously, he would take off a piece of fruit or two or three for whoever was there, or a little sweet, and just give them a little something and say, okay, Hare Krishna, and, and send them on their way. And then he would sit there and he would just honor prasadam. You know, he did it very calmly and peacefully and never in a rushed way, never talking about different things, but he, he relished prasadam. It was such a nice thing to see. There's another thing we do, especially as, as Westerners, you know, we can turn taking prasadam into meeting times and just socializing times with other devotees, just carelessly, you know, talking about whatever, and uh, really not get into the significance of honoring prasadam, mercy from Krishna. You could see with Prabhupada, he took it in that way. You could just feel, you know, he was honoring Krishna in the form of his prasadam. So wherever he was, prasadam he was ready to have right around noontime. And as he traveled and the time changes, he would just immediately adapt. There was no adjustment periods for Prabhupada. Never talked about jet lag, having to recover, you know, take a day off. Just went right in and uh, immediately accepted his responsibilities that he had, you know, given himself, giving class, greeting the deities, morning walk, meeting with the devotees, the management, giving advice. The first time I met Srila Prabhupada, I met him in Burnett Street. Upendra asked me up to go and see him and I sat down after offering um, my obeisances and, and Srila Prabhupada looked straight at me and said, so you've had doubts? And I hadn't said a word. So it was obvious straight away that I was in the presence of someone quite extraordinary because I did have doubts and I hadn't expressed them. And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, um, I really like to chant but I have a lot of trouble with the Hindu mythology, with people with four heads flying around on swans, was exactly what I said. And he sat back and put his hand back behind his head, and played with his seeker, and sort of looked up. And then he looked back at me and he said, so don't worry about that, just chant, and everything will be fine. So that was the first instruction he ever gave me. I took that very seriously and I started chanting like 32 rounds a day. <laughs> I took it on board as best I could. And then from that point, the next time I saw him was in Sydney. Someone had told him I was an artist. And he said, so you're an artist? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, I'm, I'm a painter. 
And he said, could you design a temple? I was young, so I said yes. So he got me to come around his desk and sit right next to him. And so I sat down next to him and everyone was askance, you know, they were sort of all quite taken back. And so was I, I was trembling. <laughs> I remember <laughs> everything was trembling. And he took out all these small black and white photographs of Brindarban and particularly the temple where he lived, the Radha Damodar temple, and showed me the photographs and he asked me to design a temple for Brindarban. And he gave me this whole, you know, there must have been 50 photographs. So what happened is I went away and designed a temple, but I didn't stick to the Radha Damodar format that he gave me and I designed something far too modern. And in the end I produced a huge architectural model and everything, with none of which I'd ever done before. So it was really quite wonderful because I was only 22. But he was very kind through the whole process and very supportive. And he, he did mention that when you do something with the mood of service, it's not necessary that it be carried out for the service to reach fruition because the actual engagement in that mood was the thing that mattered. So he, he was very encouraging. The only reason I wanted to share all that is that I had a lot to do with the design of Burnett Street and I had a bit to do with this as well, the current Melbourne temple. During that time there was a lot of... Um, petty divisions within the movement and people were very concerned about whether you lived in or out of the temple and all of that sort of thing. And, and, and it's all very understandable because people were very young trying to find their feet in something that was way beyond their understanding. At that stage I had reasonably long hair and I'll never forget this because I did a painting which is now in Srila Prabhupada's room in the Melbourne temple here and uh, the painting is of Radha and Krishna with a peacock behind them. And uh, I bought the painting in to give to Srila Prabhupada. It's four feet square and quite a heavy thing. And all the devotees were there and Srila Prabhupada came out into the hallway and he saw the painting and he said, oh, what is this? And I said, oh, it's a painting I've done for you, Srila Prabhupada. And uh, he smiled. And then he looked at my hair and he said, so what is this? <laughs> and I started to say something about trying to look like everyone else and not scaring people. And I got about halfway through and realised it was nonsense. And so I just sort of laughed. And he reached out and rubbed my hair and laughed. And it was really sweet. It was the exact opposite of what I expected. He was very gentle with me because I wasn't very strong spiritually or devotionally, so he was particularly soft with me. He just laughed and rubbed my hair, and it was one of the sweetest memories I have of Srila Prabhupada. And then he looked back at the painting and he said, bring it into my room. So I carried it in and he said, put this painting right next to my bed. I want it to be the first thing I see in the morning and the last thing I see before I go to sleep at night. And oh, that was it for me, you know, that, that was the perfection of anything I wanted to aspire towards. And so I did, I put it there on, and I propped it on the table and, and then he gave me some instruction, unfortunately most of which I can't remember. A lot of what Srila Prabhupada said was in Sanskrit and that's why I don't remember. But the part I do remember at the end he said, I can write, you cannot write. You can paint, I cannot paint. Let's work together in Krishna's service. And so I took that very seriously and, and did what I could to help Madhavisa with the temple here in Melbourne. Darshans were pretty amazing. When Prabhupada would greet the deities, he'd be, of course, the centre of attention. But it all just went past him. He was totally unaffected. And he went in front of the deities as their most humble servant. And that, for me, reinforced his personal qualities. He'd be in ecstasy. And his eyes would be on Radha Balaba. And you could see that tinge of 
the ointment of love. He'd be totally in love with the deities. Srila Prabhupada's lectures uh, at the Melbourne Temple were actually held in the evening. Normally, Prabhupada's Bhagavatam classes were held uh, you know, in the mornings. But uh, on the advice of Madhavisa Swami, with whom he always took counsel, he had a lot of respect for Madhavisa Swami. And uh, Madhavisa had suggested that we'd get more guests along to the temple in the evening time. So Prabhupada, with a slight movement of his head and, and a smile, he, he agreed to Madhavisa that, yes, we definitely will we'll do that. So Prabhupada uh, would take his morning walks uh, at the Botanic Gardens, as he always loved to do. Uh, it was one of his favourite uh, places to walk, he said. And then he'd come back to the temple, there would be a uh, greeting of the deities, and then Guru Puja, and then he'd return to his room, and we'd have the uh, Bhagavatam class in the evening. During Srila Prabhupada's lecture, one devotee asked a question, and his question was that if a devotee is initiated as a Brahmin and he leaves Krishna consciousness, then isn't it appropriate that if he wants to come back, that he should be reduced to the level of a Sudra? It was a very theoretical kind of a question. And Srila Prabhupada cut him off quite quickly and said, it is not for you to judge who is guilty and who is innocent. And then he tried again and he rephrased or he, he re-presented his question. It may have been that he didn't think that Srila Prabhupada understood his question, but he tried again to explain this point that somebody who leaves should be put in a lower position and then work their way back up. And Srila Prabhupada again cut him off. And then he commented afterwards that only the spiritual master knows who is actually guilty and who is innocent. And that really struck me quite deeply that Srila Prabhupada was indicating that we can't see from the outside what are people's intentions and motives so as to be able to judge them or degrade them you know, from their, for their offences or their faults. Each evening Srila Prabhupada will give a lecture and a couple of the lectures he spoke on are, uh, how society should be organised according to the Vanashram Dham and how it is the duty of the leaders of society to uh, rule properly. So I was uh, very impressed by these sort of lectures because previously I'd been to university and I'd studied economics and politics and I was interested in uh, how society should be organised. Previously in 1974, after coming back from the Mayapur festival, some devotees in America, Balavanta Prabhu in particular, were running for uh, Congress. So in elections in Australia, I uh, was put up to be the representative of the Ngobwe Trust Party, the uh, political party of the Hare Krishna movement. And uh, from this, we got so much uh, wonderful publicity, interviewed on so many of the leading uh, current affair TV programs, on the Mike Willisey show, on in Melbourne tonight. And um, when I was on the Mike Willisey show, he asked me what our policy was. And I was explaining to him how we weren't so much interested in so many political ideologies, but actually we were more interested in the uh, quality of the politician, of the morality of the politician. The politician should have good spiritual qualities uh, because in the past so many uh, politicians were so corrupt and involved in so many uh, different types of scandals and corruption. So they were of no uh, good quality. One of our platforms was that uh, if we got elected, we would close down the two uh, bars in Parliament House where the politicians would go and they would drink so much alcohol. And then uh, after deciding to have the vote, they would ring the bell so that all the uh, politicians were forced to leave the bar 
and to leave their drinks and to go back into the House and make the vote. So we made a big point that uh, so much legislation was passed in the Parliament by uh, intoxicated leaders. So we thought that this was actually quite disgusting. Our political platform was actually based on Harinam. We would go out and we would chant on the streets of Melbourne and we would stop in a particular place and perform the kirtan. And, of course, hundreds of people would come around. Then we would stop the kirtan and I would stand on a soapbox and get up and talk about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And we would talk for three or four minutes and everyone would listen and I would finish and they would all clap in appreciation. Then we would continue chanting on down the street and stop at the next corner and uh, get up and give another talk. So actually we went around the suburban streets where there were just houses and we would have kirtan up and down the, uh, the suburban streets. So in this way, not only were we participating in a political process, but uh, it was all based on Harinam of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So in that way, uh, we were spreading Krishna consciousness. So as we engaged in the uh, electoral campaign, uh, we got quite a lot of publicity. And one evening we were on a uh, show uh, called Melbourne Tonight, which was a big uh, variety show in Melbourne. And um, one man came to Australia and his name was Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he had just won uh, the title of Mr Universe for the second or third time. And he was doing a tour of Australia. So he was a very smart guy. And he saw me on this uh, political show. So he wanted to get publicity for himself. So the next day he rang up and he suggested that we uh, have a meeting together and he could bring along a cameraman and we would have publicity for him and publicity for the Hare Krishna political campaign. So we agreed to it. So the next day uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger came and we met with him and we had uh, a big discussion and uh, we were explaining to him that we're not this body with the soul but uh, he was flexing his muscles and telling us how good and how big and how powerful he was and he was fit and healthy and we weren't fit and healthy because we were doing meditation. But we challenged him to come out on an eight-hour kirtan with us and see if he could keep up. <laughs> you have to be very fit. But uh, anyhow, he declined. And then finally, uh, he brought a photographer along and he took a photograph of myself and him uh, shaking hands. And uh, the next day it appeared in the paper and it had the man of the body meets the man of the spirit and a very, very nice favourable article underneath that caption. Prabhupada was giving class in one evening. I think it was the first evening that Prabhupada was there. And uh, we'd all been working really hard and hardly slept at all for like a few days, preparing everything. And so as Prabhupada started the class, I think more than half the vote is nodded off. And then Prabhupada told you know, everyone to wake up. And I was one of them. I ended up going to sleep. I hadn't slept properly for at least three days. So I tried even standing up, but I almost fell over. <laughs> anyway, Prabhupada, for two or three times, told everyone to wake up. And then after that, Prabhupada actually got quite heavy. And he started uh, uh, explaining that the disciples' responsibility and duty is to hear from, from his guru and that it's very disrespectful for a disciple to go to sleep in front of his guru while guru is giving harikata. Prabhupada was very, very strong in that. So that was good for me because it helped me understand the relationship between disciple and guru. Because at that time, we were doing so many things, you know, but Prabhupada pointed out that the most important thing was to hear from your guru. So I always remember that. When Prabhupada was on the Vyasasan, I took it upon myself to take his water in his lota when he's finished. That was my task. I took it to the kitchen and took that water and <laughs> distributed it. And I was a bit greedy. I had most of it. <laughs> uh, Prabhupada was... Um, he was the real centre for the movement in Australia. When he was here, everybody was there, and it was just so exciting. Everybody drove from everywhere to be there, and it was all around Srila Prabhupada. And even the people on the edge who were just interested visitors would get caught up in that enthusiasm. 
and I'm sure many of them joined as a result. Sarvapadhi vini muttam tat paratena nirmalam rishikena rishikesa sevanam bhakti ruchat. This bhakti means that we have to clear ourselves from the designation. What is that designation? Everyone is thinking, I am American, I am Indian, I am European, I am Australian, I am cat, I am dog, I am this, I am that, body. We have to cleanse this bodily conception of life, that I am not this body. Aham Brahmasmi, I am spirit soul. This you have to realize. Then there will be no distinction that here is an American, here is an Australian, here is a Hindu, here is a Muslim, here is a tree, here. No. Pandita Samadharsina. <coughs> Pandita means learned, one who knows things as they are. For them, Vidya Vinaya Sampanne Brahmane Gavi Hastini Suniche Cha Sapake Cha Pandita Samadharsina. A person very learned, vidya, and very gentle. Vidya means educated, means he is gentle, sober. He is not rogues and ruffian. That is vidya. That is the taste of education. He must be very educated, sober, and silent. That is called gentleman in one word. Abhuta prasannatma na suchati na Unless one is spiritually realized, he cannot see equally everyone. Then samasarveshu madhavakti lavati para. Then one can become real devotee of the Lord. After surpassing the Brahma-bhūta stage. So this bhakti line <coughs> is not so easy. But by Chaitanya Mahāpūra's mercy we have installed the deity here in your country. We are very fortunate that Chaitanya Mahāprabhu has come to your country to teach you, how you become free of all anxieties. Uh, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. Uh, everyone is full of anxiety, but uh, everyone can be uh, free from all the anxieties if he follows the path chucked out by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, and what is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction? Very simple. Uh, uh, hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Iva Kevalam, Kalau, Nasti, 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 Gati Nanda. This is not Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's personal version. This is in the scripture, Vedic scripture. Beyond Naradiya Purat, this instruction is there. As people are followed in this age, the method also has been offered very simply. They cannot follow any uh, strong or severe austerity. It is not possible. Uh, They have been recommended simply to chant the holy name of God. That's all. Anyone can do. It is not difficult at all. Uh, then if you say that you are from India, your Chaitanya is Indian, and he is a commanding Hare Krishna, uh, why shall I chant? I have got my own God. Uh, all right. If you have got your own God, then you chant his name. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't say that you chant simply Krishna's name. If you have got any relationship with God uh, and if you know His name and address, 
<laughs> then you chant his name. Unfortunately, you do not know who is God. Neither you know his address, neither his activities. So take this Krishna. Here is a solid ah, name. And he will give you his address, his father's name, his mother's name, everything. Krishna, his form, his activities, his qualities, we cannot understand with this blunt material senses. It is not possible. Atasya Krishna Namadi Nabhavi Grayam Indriya. Then we have got this only possession in this, how we shall understand. Uh, if you engage your senses in the service of the law, Sami was Puratas, then Krishna will reveal to you the error. This is possible. Now, this word is very significant. Sevanmukhi Jivhadu. Jiva means tongue. If you simply engage your tongue in the service of the law, in gradually. Huh? So how to engage the tongue? Huh? He, it is not said that if you see or if you touch, if you smell, no. If you test. So what is the business of the tongue? The business of the tongue that we can test nice food stuff and we can vibrate. Do these two jobs. Vibrate with your tongue, Hare Krishna, and take as much as possible prasad. <laughs> and you become a devotee. Thank you very much. Make a trial. The temple is here. We are inviting. Come here. Do these two business. And our Madhu Bhisa Maharaj is ready to give you prasada <laughs> and chance for dancing and singing. It begins with um, taught together. The whole universe. Does that mean all, all the worlds, all the worlds in the universe, or just this earth? You're just wondering how, how it was possible for one king to rule a whole world. Seems like it is very difficult. Nowadays we have so many leaders and they cannot manage it. Forget that. We are thinking that you cannot rule over, therefore others cannot. You are thinking in your turn. But there are, that is possible. But that is not our field of activities. It is uh, others, politics and... Uh, but let us, our business is how to improve our spiritual condition of life. Even if we don't rule over the world, it doesn't matter. So why you are anxious to rule over the world? It is not our business. You chant Hare Krishna and take prasad. <laughs> A memorable feature about Prabhupada's visit were the big kirtans that we had every night after Prabhupada's lecture. Prabhupada had praised Madhadvisa Swami, who was our GBC, for his ability to lead kirtans, his enthusiasm for kirtan. Uh, he had once told him, I think in India, that Madhadvisa is the emperor of Kirtan. Every day we would dance, we would sing. Uh, he had enlivened us all for several years. And, of course, when Prabhupada came, uh, he was especially enthusiastic. So he would lead the Kirtans. Uh, when Prabhupada came, uh, his secretary was Paramahamsa Swami. Paramahamsa, I remember, used to love playing the drum, really pounding away on it. And we would just all let loose. We would just dance up and down. We would let ourselves go. And 
seeing Srila Prabhupada sitting on the Vyasa Sand with that characteristic movement of his head from side to side. He would slightly close his eyes. He would play his cartels uh, and just become fully absorbed in the kirtan. And when we saw Srila Prabhupada in that kind of concentration and meditation on the holy names and seeing him appreciate Madhadvisa leading such enthusiastic kirtans and seeing the devotees so enlivened by it, uh, it was just a fantastic reciprocation. All of the devotees just loved it. We would we would go wild. <laughs> me playing the guitar. <laughs> One thing I do remember about that particular time in 1975 is that there was that sort of breakaway, what we call the Hari Ball group, had a fairly big follow in Melbourne and because Prabhupada was there they would all come along to the program in the Kirtan and, and they would try to persuade Prabhupada to come to their place but Prabhupada said no you can just come along here do kirtan and take prasadam was the difficulty. And a number of times he did stress the importance of kirtan and prasadam, specifically in Australia. So that's one thing that really struck me and I still remember it to this day and trying to do it in my own small way to continue this program. Very simple but very effective. Some or other people can become attached to hearing and chanting the holy name of the Lord and partaking the divine remnants of his beautiful vegetarian food. It certainly opens up their hearts. Prabhupada leaving the temple in 197 Dank Street, which is one block off from the ocean. Beaconsfield Parade is the name of the road that goes along the ocean there. And Srila Prabhupada in the morning would walk out there and go along 
Now, because Prabhupada's getting into the car, it, it indicates that he would be going down to the botanical gardens. Because if he was going on to the beachfront, he would just, you know, walk. This is Prabhupada arriving in the botanical gardens there in Melbourne, which was a very uh, beautiful place. You know that the British had the tradition of building these elaborate botanical gardens in wherever they would have the colonies, whether it was in Africa or in uh, India. So Australia was like that too. They would have these elaborate botanical gardens that they would construct and they would bring all these different exotic trees into one place. And uh, Srila Prabhupada would go early in the morning and he would come and say, they spent so much money building this and now look at in the morning no one has come to take advantage of it. We're the only ones. Prabhupada would be walking in the botanical gardens at 7 in the morning and everybody else would be whizzing by and their cars going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and we would be taking advantage of their botanical gardens. Srila Prabhupada would preach the philosophy of Krishna consciousness using nature. He, he would tell us many times that you can learn from nature. And when he would be going on these morning walks, he would point out things. And he would amaze us. Sometimes he would say, oh, this is a certain type of a tree. And he would quote the name of the tree in Latin like he was some kind of a botanist and lo and behold would go and look at the tree and the name would be there and it would be that tree. And he would point out the medicinal value in the trees and Prabhupada was very educated, not just in uh, spiritual things, but he had so much material knowledge that he would amaze the devotees. You could see the, the city from the distance and there were buildings and I, I can't remember exactly his question, but it was something to, along the lines of why do they build these big buildings? And being somebody who was always a little bit in awe of architecture, I remember saying something like, well, they like to be remembered, you know. Um, I'm doing some big construction. I guess that's a sort of the fault of an artist anyway, isn't it? You do a painting or leave something behind. And Prabhupada said, that's exactly the same as the washerman's donkey. He likes to be known for being able to carry some big load. It's just no different. Yeah, the washerman's ass. I remember thinking then, hmm. I was working at the time as a designer and an artist. and I had a job in a TV studio here in Melbourne. Prabhupada sort of dismissing so-called lofty aesthetics of contemporary architecture. The mode of passion, I guess it is, isn't it? You know, you're... You like to work in the mode of passion and leave something behind that you'll be known for. But yeah, Prabhupada's perspective sort of cut through it. All of us would just pile into cars and then follow Prabhupada for the morning walk. We'd all follow behind. You'd have the leaders in front. You'd have um, Madhavisa, who was the GBC. Deepak, he was the temple president of Melbourne at the time. And you had a few others there. And then the rest of us would be walking behind. And um, it had been raining a little bit, so the grass was moist. And Prabhupada would be walking along the pathway, like a cemented pathway, and then just go straight off the pathway and walk across the grass. And so I, uh, I just read just the day before that Lord Chaitanya, wherever he stepped, people would take his, the dust of his feet. So I thought oh, I should get some dust from Prabhupada's feet. And so um, I was walking behind Prabhupada. Uh, Madhavisa was on his right and Deepak was on his left. And then I was looking for the footprints. I could see the footprints of Madhavisa and Deepak really clearly. As you walk in the grass, it leaves an imprint quite deep, about half an inch deep. And I was looking, uh, Prabhupada wasn't making uh, an impression in the grass. So I decided that I would get right down to actually see Prabhupada's foot come off and see the grass underneath. And I was looking as Prabhupada's foot came off, the grass even wasn't uh, bent or anything. It wasn't that Prabhupada was like, you know, an inch or two off the ground. It wasn't like that. It, it appeared that Prabhupada's feet were actually touching the ground, but they weren't. I became a little confused at that time. I didn't really understand what I was seeing. And then uh, later I read in Bhagavatam where Yudhishthira Maharaj, he never touched the ground. So I understood from that that Prabhupada was a Nitya Siddha, that he was never a conditioned soul and he came directly from the spiritual world. I mean, I didn't need to see that 
to come to that conclusion because by serving Prabhupada, I was able to experience within that uh, my understanding of Krishna consciousness and my detachment from the world, as it was developing, I understood that this is a pure Vaishnava. Because, you know, serving a materialist or ordinary person, these things don't happen in the heart. But that was really wonderful to see that. My son, Janaka, who was very young at the time, probably four years old, and one morning walked Srila Prabhupada took Janika's hand in his, squeezed it very hard and kept it in his pocket all through the morning walk. It was probably Janika, my son, that spent more personal time with Srila Prabhupada than I did. In the Melbourne temple, he used to go up to Srila Prabhupada's rooms. I would dress him in the morning and he'd disappear for the day. Prabhupada's assistants travelling with him and the other devotees would be standing guard at Prabhupada's door to his room. So Janika knew his way in and out of Prabhupada's room, so he'd sneak in through the side window and spend the day with Srila Prabhupada. He'd play boats in the bathroom when Srila Prabhupada slept. Sometimes he would sleep under the bed there with Prabhupada, take prasadam with him. When we were on morning walks, Prabhupada would, uh, of course, be chanting Japa, and then uh, we would follow in unison and then Prabhupada would stop and he would say something or point out some philosophical point. He would walk on again and everyone would start chanting Jatma. And this little Madhaji, Ramaniya, her name was, her chanting was over and above everyone else's chanting, <laughs> very loud. And um, sometimes you couldn't hear what Prabhupada was saying. But you had to really snuggle in around Prabhupada as close as you could to actually hear what he was saying. And, so you might hear, you know, someone chanting Japa in the background, not knowing what to do when they couldn't hear what Prabhupada was saying. So then Ramani was chanting this Japa very loud and, and everyone else was thinking, oh, she's chanting so loud. You could kind of feel the vibe of the devotees, you know, tone it down, please. And then Prabhupada actually commented, she's chanting very nicely. You know, <laughs> this is good chanting. So that um, put us in our place. Prabhupada had gone out on his walk and something needed doing in Prabhupada's room. I don't recall exactly what it was. I think it was to tidy up. There must have been a lot of devotees in there before he went for the walk. Anyway, I was feeling Prabhupada's potency in the room. And I was feeling very low and dirty and unclean. And what are you? Who are you? to put yourself before this exalted person. I could recognise that, you know, he was just so glorious. And I think you should go away out of the sight from this man, you don't belong here. I was actually thinking that in my mind, yeah. And as I thought that the front gate there opened and Prabhupada looked straight up at me and beamed a big smile and called me down to greet the deities. So I went down and went in the temple. So that sort of dissipated any doubts. I thought, well, if Prabhupada's accepting, then I felt freed from that. And I, well, I served then for 16 years, non-stop, 18 hours a day. <laughs> I stayed behind to do the room and get the room all ready for Srila Prabhupada and I would always be downstairs and open the door when Prabhupada came in and there was a huge kirtan. Prabhupada came in and I had some flowers in my hand and Prabhupada walked up the stairs and in Melbourne there was a, an area where you got halfway up the stairs and there was a landing and then you went further up and Prabhupada walked up the stairs and Prabhupada turned around and the kirtan was louder and louder and Prabhupada looked down at me and he saw I had the flowers in my hand. He walked back down the stairs and took the flowers out of my hand and walked back up the stairs. That was pretty far out. Uh, why is there a varieties? They say originally there was just a, a cell and by adaptation in some circumstances one kind would live and another would die so all these varieties adapted to different conditions who adapted well they just who managed accidentally uh, that is nonsense nothing happens accidentally that is nonsense there must be some arrangement what is happening is accidentally well, they say why every... why you are taking care of the trees so many things nothing is done accident. 
you do not see the cause. Let accidentally money come and sit down. Why do they not do that? If accident is there, let accident come and I'll become rich man. Why do they try? Why do they go to the college? Let accidentally become a PhD. This is all rascal. There are five causes. Activity, the place, the uh, proportion of energy, and ultimately sanctioned by God. Then things happen. Otherwise, there is no question of accident. Srila Papa really made a point about the neck beads should always be tight. They were, you know, bought off the shelf somewhere in Vrindavan, whatever, so they wouldn't be tailor-made for the devotees' necks, so they'd usually be just loose. But even though they were put on loosely, Srila Papa insisted on a number of occasions that, no, they must be tight. I think it's got something to do with remembering, remembering the beads are there and, you know, the wear servants of the spiritual master like that. I remember I was very nervous, of course, going before Prabhupada to receive an initiation. Is that me there? I think so. <laughs> Put on about 40 kilos since <laughs> I was worried that I would forget before rules and regulations. So I said no illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication, no meat eating like that to try and uh, make sure I didn't forget. And then Prabhupada said uh, so many negatives because I was stressing the word no as though it was abhorrent to give these things up. And Prabhupada said, isn't there any positive? And then I said, I stand chanting Hare Krishna 16 rounds. There were a number of occasions when I was involved or sat in or was part of initiations. Srila Prabhupada always insisted that the doors and windows remain closed Devotees would open the windows like as if the smoke coming from the fire was a botheration. I don't know exactly why, but he would insist that we just keep the doors and windows closed. It didn't matter. The smoke was not harmful. There was a, a chaise lounge that he would sit on. When the uh, guests came, he would sit there and preach to the guests. This was a very big room. All the devotees could actually fit. It was almost as big as the temple room. One particular preaching engagement was with a social worker from the uh, Department of Social Welfare. We actually rang up the departments and tried to get the ministers to come and meet with him, but the minister couldn't come, but he sent one of his top men. And this man came along, and actually he was very, very nervous. And uh, uh, I don't think he actually wanted to be there. Anyhow, he met with Prabhupada, and uh, he was respectful. And then um, Prabhupada started to tell him about the, our principles and how uh, one of our principles was no illicit sex. And when Prabhupada mentioned this, this man became very, very agitated. And Prabhupada kept talking about this, and this man became so agitated that uh, in the end he wanted to cut the conversation off. <laughs> Although Prabhupada was giving him the answers and the solutions to so many of their social welfare problems, this man was not willing to listen. Prabhupada's preaching was very powerful, but uh, they were not uh, willing to hear. And also on the same visit, he met with um, one man whose name was Brian Dixon. And Brian Dixon was a very, very famous man in the state of Victoria. He was a very famous footballer. And uh, later on after that, he became a politician, government minister. He came with his secretary and she was not dressed very appropriately. She had a short dress. She had the makeup on everything and uh, she was very provocatively dressed. So Brian Dixon came in and met Srila Prabhupada and he made the comment straight away that uh, he saw the Hare Krishna devotees on the streets singing and dancing and chanting and whenever he saw them, he saw that they were always happy. So he asked Srila Prabhupada, why are you successful? And he knew that uh, we did not participate in taking drugs and he was uh, impressed by this and Prabhupada explained that we follow uh, four principles and one of them is no intoxication and that by chanting Hare Krishna you become happy. And uh, Brian Dixon, he was listening. So then Prabhupada mentioned that we do not engage in illicit sex. And Brian Dixon became embarrassed. He actually he blushed like anything. Almost immediately he looked at his watch and said, oh, I'm sorry, I've got another appointment. And he had to leave. So Prabhupada was preaching very, very strongly. 
and he was giving these particular men uh, the answers to their uh, problems that they were dealing with. But again, they were not willing to listen or to implement this particular program. Then again, we had uh, one newspaper reporter come from the Age newspaper, which is the main Melbourne newspaper. And Srila Prabhupada preached to this man for about 45 minutes. Uh, simply preached to him about, you are not this body. Straight preaching. Although the man was asking general sort of questions, Prabhupada just stuck with this one point of how you are not this body and you are the servant of Krishna. And uh, he just preached to the guy full on. And the guy just sat there and listened. So then um, the next day he wrote a very, very nice article. It was about half a page on the second page of the Melbourne Age, uh, quite an extensive uh, article and very well written because uh, most newspaper reporters, they actually misinterpret what the original message was. And uh, we showed Srila Prabhupada the, uh, the newspaper article the next day and he was so pleased that he asked us to get 12 copies of that particular um, article and uh, he got his secretary to send them to some of the big life members in India. He would hold darshans there some evenings in his room and he'd sit and talk and Prabhupada would display his usual erudite knowledge. But he had this compassion that he would hear everyone and consider. Even if you spoke, you could only feel foolish in front of Prabhupada, but he seemed to tolerate and uh, he had a lot of compassion. But at the same time, with the guests that would come, he would show a lot of interest, but he would not tolerate um, the subject being moved. So he would be very quick to bring the subject back uh, within the Krishna conscious domain, uh, even if he would insinuate that they were in illusion. He did it in such a way that nobody was ever offended. Prabhupada had this knack of uh, speaking to people. So in Melbourne, um, I remember he spoke to one of the parents of a devotee and he made them feel extremely comfortable. But at the same time, Prabhupada was very strong in stressing that uh, Krishna consciousness was for everyone and not just a sectarian movement, uh, but it was for everyone and it was a practical movement. Prabhupada had this skill of disarming people's uh, defence just through his purity and his straight speaking and his simple language. And it was understood by everyone. There was nothing duplicit in his language. It was straightforward. My uncle, Father Wallace, he was a Jesuit, but he was in charge of the whole of Victoria, so he's like the head Jesuit. And I said to my mother, I'd like to get my uncle to meet. Prabhupada, so somehow she got that arranged. My mum was pretty good at arranging those things. And so my uncle came, and we're all sitting around in Prabhupada's beautiful room on the beautiful blue carpet. And he was sitting back in the chairs, and he was quite elegant sort of a guy, and a very good speaker, as the Jesuits are pretty well trained in philosophy. Prabhupada spoke philosophy with him quite a bit and he seemed to be able to follow the thread of it and answer it, which most people, when they met Prabhupada, they kind of lost it. Prabhupada was just probing into what they understood and they couldn't understand what they believed themselves. But he seemed to have some belief himself. Anyway, it went on for about, I guess, three quarters of an hour, having a pretty lively conversation, but jokey too, a lot of laughter and so on. And then um, finally... The session was over and he got up and shook hands and, and left and we're all sitting around Prabhupada and Prabhupada sitting there just kind of rocking a bit. And I said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, what did you think of my uncle? And Prabhupada looked at us all and he smiled and he looked at me and said, a very pleasant drunkard. <laughs> and that was like, we just all cracked up laughing because immediately he walked in, Prabhupada must have picked up he'd had something. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was a regular drinker. He had that kind of look, his face, you know, a bit over reddish. And yes, um, it was pretty well strong through the whole order at that time, I'd say, the whole Catholic Church. That was the one thing the priest could do, have a good drink. But the way Prabhupada could crack a joke was really amazing. 
The minister is elected according to public will in our society. They, because they have made a department just like you do. What is the department? Social welfare. Social welfare. So if they find social welfare, why not help? Why they bring politics? If actually there is social welfare here, why they should not support it? Yeah, well, you're right. But in our society, minister is elected to carry out certain policies. Not what he wants, but what the people sort of voted for. And say a text to support. And if your policy is social reformation. Social reform is not our policy. The social welfare. So just to look after those who are in trouble. Mm. That's our policy. Well, everyone is in trouble. But at the present moment, even the ministers are in trouble. Yes, but that is not what our function is. <laughs> Everybody's in trouble. <laughs> Physician he writes her. You see? They are also drunkards, they are also woman hunters, <laughs> and meat eaters, and gambling, that's all. They require to be yeah. rectified. But they can't help that. That's society. You have to go and change society. The society tells us to act But um, unless you change the society, how you can make social welfare? Well, if you keep inter- them as it is, there is the question of welfare. Give it a different interpretation to the word. Inter- how is, I, I don't Does understand me. Basically, yes. basically, right. one must be first class ideal man. Yeah. That is one. That's why it's so very difficult. You have to work on your own and all you have to see that you have freedom to work. You and if you convince out. enough people no, no. to go your Our way. own program. It is not box properly. You find out fault with us. What? You find out what is our fault. I then can't see any fault. Then, then you can disagree. But when you see everything is nice, how you will not accept it? Unless you are biased. Of course I am biased. I have been brought up differently. Yes. That's, that's like our... Because so you are biased against my life. No, we are not biased. We you say, say I'm, I'm just like we are not biased. We are allowing. Uh, we say that if you want to be first class man, then you must not commit sinful activities. Hmm. That is our problem. But I, I as a public servant, I am not here to change society. But society we are also me. public. What we, are, we belong to the public. You must become our servant also. Yeah. But? We are public, members of the public. Yeah. So you should become our servant also, if you are public servant. A public servant is a, in our philosophy, is a man who serves a minister elected by the people. And this way he serves the public. Yeah. And what the public decides, yeah, it votes are, accordingly. We are reforming the public. Just like we are proposing here. I am not proposing, Krishna says that one must be peaceful. But how to become peaceful? If his mind is always disturbed, how he become, can become peaceful? You're quite right. So that is the secret of success. You want to make people peaceful, but you do not know how to make him peaceful. Yeah. So therefore you have to adopt this. You have a competitive society. Yeah. We say that you chant Hare Krishna, Eat here sumptuously, live here comfortably, and you become peaceful. Hmm. It is guaranteed. If anyone, even a madman, agrees to this, this principle, that let him chant Hare Krishna mantra, hmm. take whatever nice food stuff we prepare, take, and live peacefully. He will be peaceful. What's your answer that still such a small percentage of the population, tiny percentage of the population, no. except the philosophy that sounds so Tiny right. percentage, just like <coughs> there are so many stars in the sky yeah. and there is one moon. In percentage, the moon is nothing. If you take percentage of the stars, the moon is nothing. 
But moon is important, then all the nonsense starts. <laughs> but if you take percentage, he has no percentage both. But because he is moon, he is important, and all these rascals starts. This is the example. Yeah, well, what is the use of taking percentage of the stars in, in the presence of moon? Let there be one moon that is sufficient. There is no question of percentage. One ideal man. Just like in Christian world, one ideal Jesus Christ. How do you feel about Mao Zedong? Huh? What is that? This is how you feel about Mao Zedong. In China, he's an ideal man. He's a uh, communist. His ideal is all right. In China, he is. Yeah, his idea, communist idea, mm. that everyone should be happy. That is good idea. Mm. But they do not know how to make it. Just like they are taking care of the human being in the state, but they are sending poor animals to this letter. So for the satisfaction of the tongue of the human being, the animals should be cut through. That is the defect. A minister regards himself as a servant of the people who can be kicked out in the That is the defect. The people are rascals and they have elected another rascal. That is, that is the defect. Well, but that's how it is. So what can we do? Then hopeless. Oh, you can. You can work on the class. So we are going without depending on this rascal. Yes. We are going on. If we instruct a man, please do not have Illicit sex. Have you got any objection? What? If I advise yes. somebody that do not have illicit sex, yes. have you got any objection? Yeah, I have. You have? Yeah. Illicit. If I, say, I like sex. My wife likes sex. Huh? We just enjoy it. I couldn't live without it. Our marriage is happier because I have sex. Let's see. <laughs> the police. No, we don't private sex. We private. We don't have two children. Illicit, illicit uh, sex. Well, it's a, you know, use a pill, or use contraceptives, or use all kinds of things. Because it makes our... Why, why, why uh, do you use contraceptives? Because we don't want any more children. Then why don't you stop sex? Because we like sex. Yes. Because <laughs> we enjoy it. <laughs> that means, uh, go to physician, I want to do everything I like, still I want treatment. This is the position. You want... That is not for treatment. No, no, I say... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you are... You have, you have, come, no, no, you have come for treatment here. Yeah. I was invited Because you have failed Pardon? to control the society, your activity, therefore you have come here, treatment. But when I prescribe medicine, you don't accept. I haven't come for treatment. I'm no, sorry. yes. That's Otherwise, why you are invited? Here? That, just to help you in your social activities, social welfare activities, to take some suggestion from her. But when you give the suggestion, you reject it. That is your position. Srila Prabhupada would always give wonderful lectures, but sometimes devotees would be falling asleep, you know, maybe due to having too much prasadam. And I must admit, in those days, I used to fall asleep a lot. <laughs> But uh, I do remember one incident. It really floored people. Uh, we had a program at uh, the Play Theatre in St Kilda, which was a pretty hip part of town. And it wasn't a very big theatre, and it was kind of cosy and intimate. It was eclectic, put it that way, you know. There was a lot of philosopher hippie types there, and. And Srila Prabhupada was sitting on this Vyasasan. He gave this lecture and the acoustics, unfortunately, weren't that good. It was reverberating around the room and it was hard to catch what Srila Prabhupada was saying, but there were a lot of people there. And Anyway, at one particular point, somebody asked a question. Well, there were so many yogis and swamis that have come and this and that. What can you do? Either what can you do, inferring what that others can't do, or what can you do? And Srila Prabhupada said... I can save you from death. And then there was complete silence and everyone knew that Srila Prabhupada meant it. 
it was the most sobering thing I've ever heard someone say. So from then on, the rest of the program was sober. People were respectful. Papa had a great, great affection for Australia and the preaching in Australia because um, we could see that when hearing Papa giving lectures at different parts of the world, he would refer back to Australia, how the preaching was going on in Australia and they have gone to jail in Australia or they have a Rathiatra and they're distributing more books in Australia than everywhere else in the world and it was a, a great joy uh, for Srila Prabhupada to have his devotees in Australia. He sent some of his dear devotees there in the beginning, Bali Mardan and uh, Upendra Das went there in the beginning, and it was an English-speaking country that had never been exposed to Krishna consciousness or anything like Krishna consciousness before. It was a completely fresh start. Whereas in England, some of his godbrothers had gone there before and there was some you know, affiliation with India, but Australia was like a remote, far remote place. And uh, people had taken to Krishna consciousness very elaborately and very um, you know, diligently. And it was uh, through the book distribution that that could be gauged. That here in Australia, a relatively small country, maybe 15 or 17 million people in the whole country, they were one of the top book distributors in the whole world at that time. At one point, Australia was the number one book distributing country in the world in the early 70s. And we used to, you know, make sure that Srila Prabhupada heard about that. We would send the report, and uh, Srila Prabhupada was always beaming. I remember when he came out with the Chaitanya Chaitamrita, and we were there in India, and Prabhupada said, and we will print 15,000 volumes of this book. And I was there, and I said, Prabhupada, we'll take 10,000. And Prabhupada said, oh, Madhavisa is taking 10,000 already. We must print 20,000. <laughs> and... Prabhupada saw that this was a, you know, a young and vibrant and healthy country. Sometimes Australia is referred to as the lucky country. And Srila Prabhupada uh, would go there and he would love the ghee that was there, the cow's ghee. So he worked out uh, you know, a program that the Australian devotees could pay for their books in ghee because there was money being sent from Los Angeles to India to finance all the different building projects there. So instead of uh, having the devotees from Australia send money from Australia to Los Angeles, and then Los Angeles send money to India, Prabhupada said, no, forget about all that sending back and forth. Instead of paying for your books in dollars to Los Angeles, pay for your books in ghee sent to India. <laughs> Because this high-quality ghee sent from Australia to India was more valuable than the dollars sent to Australia. And this way, he would send the ghee, and he said uh, the devotees would be able to distribute this ghee to the life members in India and uh, feed the devotees uh, you know, with high-quality ghee so they would stay healthy while they were doing their preaching work in India. For so, for so many years, um, you know, thousands of pounds of ghee, this alauri ghee, a very famous ghee, it came in this big 10-gallon tin or 5 gallon tin, paying for our books in ghee. That was quite, it was quite unique. I was the guard, so to speak, stopping the hordes getting up there and bothering him. And um, Prabhupada used to come out of his room very late at night or early in the morning and go into the other room where he would do his dictation. And I'd just be sitting there with my Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes I'd be fully conscious and sometimes I'd be partially not conscious. Um, and Prabhupada stopped one time and just spoke to me. He asked me what my name was and he asked me a few simple questions and I, I sort of replied back to him. I was a bit nervous being around Prabhupada in the sense that I was in, in awe of Prabhupada and I didn't really feel comfortable being too familiar. I was a little bit awestruck by Prabhupada. So um, yeah, we just had a few simple exchanges on the top of the steps in the dead of night. <laughs> And uh, Prabhupada went off into his room and, and did his translating. It inspired me thinking that there's no one else awake except the two of us and Prabhupada's in there actually translating the Bhagavatam. Every night after the Bhagavatam class there was a big feast that was served out in what was known as Parampara Hall, which was a large room on the ground floor of Prabhupada House. That was the Prasadam room at the time. So Dwapiana and other cooks prepared very, very nice prasadam, and this was the, the highlight of the evening for many, especially those who had come to the temple for the first time. On the second night, 
I remember Twipiana had prepared apple crumble. And apple crumble at those days was apples with cinnamon with a mixture of oats, flour and butter and baked in the oven until the topping was crispy. Now, it was a bit controversial because we thought that oats were not fit to be eaten by devotees. Someone said that somebody said that Prabhupada said that oats are meant for horses. So some devotees thought that apple crumble was not bona fide. Anyway, Draipiana made apple crumble, many, many, many trays of it. Some of the best apple crumble that he'd ever made. After the lecture, Prabhupada went up to his room and he felt a little hungry and he asked Sruti Kitty to go down and see what prasadam there was available, what was being served for the devotees. So Sruti Kitty went down to the kitchen and brought back some apple crumble. Prabhupada ate a whole bowl of it and then he sent Sruti Kitty downstairs for more. He said, please bring me more of those crispy apples. And after we heard the story, we realized that apple crumble was now bona fide and fit to be eaten by devotees. So then apple crumble became uh, a dessert that was served at practically every feast. So our process of knowledge we should take from the supreme authority. Then we save time for research work. That is Krishna consciousness movement. We take perfect knowledge from Krishna. I may be imperfect, just like child is imperfect. I may be imperfect, you may be imperfect. But if you take the perfect knowledge from the Supreme Perfect, then your knowledge is perfect. Uh, that is the process. This is called avarohopantha, knowledge coming, deductive knowledge. Uh, so everything is there, and if you uh, like to take advantage of this movement, make your life perfect, go back to home, back to Godhead, then fully utilize the center, our Melbourne center, come here, read our books, and argue, try to understand with your full knowledge, no blindly acceptance. Uh, there is reason, there is argument, there is philosophy, there is science, everything is there. Uh, and if you accept that simply by chanting, I shall realize, that is also allowed. Uh, both ways. If you accept this simple process, the chant Hare Krishna and realize God, that is also fact. And if you think, what is this nonsense, chanting Hare Krishna? Then you read books. <coughs> Both ways we are prepared. Come and take advantage of this moment. Thank you very much. Jai, jai, jai. Hello, Prabhupada. We have decided in the scriptures that um, Lord Brahma rides on a, on a swan, a hamsa. Is this, we take this to mean that it's a real swan or is it something? Symbolic. Not symbolic, it is fact. <coughs> Why do you say symbolic? It's rather unusual. Unusual? What experience you have got? <coughs> you have no experience. Have you got any experience of other planetary system? What is there? <coughs> then? Your experience is very teeny. So you should not calculate Brahma's life and other things by your teeny experience. <laughs> now, in the Bhagavad-gītā it is said that the duration of life of Brahma, sahasra yuga-pajyantam arahajyat brahmano vidu. Now Brahma's life is stated in the sastra. We have already explained that we accept the authoritative statement of sastra. Now Brahma's life is stated there. Arahat means his one day is equal to our four yugas. Four yugas means forty-three hundred, four million three hundred thousand years, and multiply it by one thousand. Sahasra yuga pajyantam. Sahasra means one thousand, and yuga yuga means the four million, three hundred thousand years makes a jugo and multiply it by one thousand. 
That period is Brahma's one day. Similarly, he has got one night. Similarly, he has got one month. Similarly, he has got one year. And such hundred years he will live. So how you can calculate? How it is within your experience? You will think something mysterious? No. Your experience is nothing. Therefore, you have to take experience from the perfect person, Krishna. Then your knowledge is perfect. That I have already said. Don't try to understand with your teeny experience everything. Then you will be failure. When one gets the serve Krishna virtually. That I have already explained that uh, you are coming here. Even though you are not initiated, that is also service. So if you deposit one cent daily, one day it may become hundred dollars. So when you get the hundred dollars, you can get the business. <laughs> so you come here daily, one cent, one cent, when it will be hundred dollars, you will become a devotee. So this is not wasted. It is uh, that is stated in the Simad Bhagavata. Krita Punna Punya. Krita Punna. Krita means done. And Subhdev Goswami is describing when Krishna was playing with his coward boy's friends. So he was describing that these coward boys who are playing with Krishna, they have not come to this position in one day. Krita Punna Punja, after life, after life, having performed pious activities, now they have come to this position, that they are allowed to play with the Supreme. This person, this person, when they're suffering, when they actually, when they say that they're happy and they're not afraid to die. Someone who is not afraid to die and says that he's not suffering, how do people... He's a madman. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all. laughs> uh, who is caring for madmen? <laughs> It's very easy to convince some people that they're not their bodies. It's not very easy to convince them that they're not their minds. Is there something, some way we could explain that? That will take time. How can we expect? In one minute everyone will understand everything. He requires education, time. If he's prepared to give the time, then he will understand. <coughs> not that within five minutes, ten minutes he'll understand the whole thing. That's not possible. He is a diseased man. He requires treatment, medicine, and diet. In this way he will understand. A diseased man, if he doesn't care for medicine, diet, then he will suffer. That's all. Yes? Uh, if we've been here lifetime after lifetime performing in place activities, well, does it mean that we have to be here lifetime after lifetime performing pious activities to develop our, our sinful reactions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have been here for many lifetimes performing sinful activities. So is it possible to counteract all those sinful activities in one lifetime, or does it require many One lives? minute. That is Krishna consciousness movement. One minute. You are not reading Bhagavad Gita? What Krishna says, Sarva Sarman Paritajya Mami Kang Saranang Braja Angta Sarva Pape Bhavakshayami. You surrender to me, give up your all business. I'll give you relief from all sinful reaction. Immediately. Ridiculous one minute. My dear Krishna, I was forgotten. Now I understand. I fully surrender to you. And you become immediately free from all things. Without any reservation. Without any politics. If you fully surrender, Krishna is assuring, 
આંકવા સર્વ પાપી અમુક પૈસા માં શું છો એ રિયાસીઓ ડોન્ટ ટોરી વેધર આઈ વિલ બી એબલ ટુ ટુ ગીવ યુ રિલીફ ફ્રોમ ઓલ યસ માં શું છો ફેરેસ ગેરંટી યુ ડુ ધીસ સો હાઉ મચ ટાઈમ ઇઝ રિક્વાયર્ડ ટુ સરેન્ડર ટુ કૃષ્ણ ઇમિડિયેટલી કેન ડુ ધેટ મામે વોઇસ ટુ સી અસંગ સર ધેન યુ કમ ટુ મી વિધાઉટ એન ડાઉન એવરીથિંગ ઇઝ ધેર Krishna has given everything fully. If you accept it, then life is very simple. There is no difficulty. Yes? How long do you say it is before Krishna comes to this planet again in physical form, in human form? Now calculate, I have already given the duration of one day, twelve hours of Brahma, means four million three hundred years, three hundred thousand years <coughs> multiplied by one thousand. What it comes? Four thousand three hundred million. No, no. Four billion. Four billion. Oh, depends on opinion. <laughs> In Australia, they calculate different. <laughs> anyway, what is your Australian calculation? Let me know. The opinion is something else. Oh. Anyway, I give you the right figure. Four million, according to American and English calculation. Four million, three hundred thousand years. And multiply it by one thousand. Then, what it comes according to English calculation? Four billion, four billion three hundred million. Huh? Four billion three hundred. That is twelve hours. And add again twelve hours night. Then eight billion. Six hundred million. So Krishna comes after this period. In one day. After one day, a Brahma he appears. Yes. Yeah. But does uh, the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also appear every every yes. day? Yes. Ah, uh, following Krishna, Krishna comes in the Dapurju. After finishing his business in in this universe, he goes to another universe. In this way, the rotation takes nine billion years. He stays in one universe for one hundred twenty-five years. Everything is their calculation in this asta. Now we can imagine how many universes are there. That is all together material world. That is stated in the Atma Bahunai Tino, Kinga Tino, Sabadina. Vishabya Aham Idam Kistam Ekang Sina Situ Jagat. This material creation is one fourth creation of the whole. God's property. At this time in Melbourne there were two groups of devotees. There were those who were living in the temple and there were those that were known as the outside devotees. I'm not even sure that we were that respectful as calling them devotees, but we felt that if they weren't living in the temple they were not qualified to be devotees. We had a rather limited perspective of things. But amongst these devotees that were living outside there were those who had broken away from ISKCON and they had concocted their own philosophy. And at the end of this uh, evening class, some of their doubts were brought up at question time. Prabhupada very kindly allowed us to have some very lengthy question and answer periods at the end of these classes. Uh, one boy who was in this circle asked Prabhupada, uh, he said, can you take initiation by accepting the spiritual master in your heart without actually taking and Prabhupada cut him off and said that these are all bogus propositions. He said, it has no meaning. If you think in yourself that I'm eating, he said, will you be satisfied? He said, you actually have to eat to be satisfied. If you just simply imagine that you've eaten, you will not satisfy your appetite, indicating that you have to physically take initiation from the spiritual master, not just take initiation in the heart. This, he said, was bogus. At the end of the, the lectures, he would stop at the temple doorway 
and uh, I'd put his slippers on his feet and um, he would allow me to pick him up and he'd put uh, his arm around my shoulder and I'd carry him up the stairs in Dank Street. Sometimes he would give me little comments on the way, just the two of us could hear. Other times he'd be very sober. But all the time, once we got past the doorway, I would get a little jovial comment of some sort. But the amazing thing was, uh, I always, never, ever, ever forgotten this point that it always seemed to me as though he was weightless. There was no weight there at all. I could walk up the stairs with him easy with just holding him, carrying him up. It was amazing how weightless he was. We were sitting in Srila Prabhupada's room, not his bedroom, but his sitting room, where he would receive his guests. What you're seeing now is one of the lawyers we've brought up to speak to Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada wanted to talk with distinguished guests every night. And it was the duty of our advanced team to arrange for people to come and speak to Prabhupada. And finally we had our own building and a very elegant place to bring distinguished guests. People like the Archbishop of Melbourne and the Episcopal Bishop of Melbourne. Srila Prabhupada sitting on his uh, elegant chaise lounge that we uh, purchased at the antique shop. And we went overboard a little bit. We had it reupholstered in that part of blue color to match the walls because we understood that Srila Prabhupada liked the blue and white and gold combination as his color scheme for his room. So Srila Prabhupada was speaking to the lawyers and explaining uh, Vedic philosophy. They were very respectful. As you may know, in the beginning of Krishna consciousness in Australia, there was quite a struggle for proselytizing Krishna consciousness in the street. Uh, in Melbourne, where they had a very liberal-minded city council, they had a front of being very tolerant, but they really wanted us to get off the street. The people that had their big multi-million dollar boutiques and stores didn't fancy the idea of the devotees being part of the landscape. So we hired this lawyer, Wally, for uh, advice and what to do. And the city council would issue us these tickets. And we had received instruction from Prabhupada that we can chant in jail or we can chant on the street. It doesn't make any difference. So why waste our money on expensive lawyers? And eventually they'll see the folly in their persecution and uh, leave us alone. And sure enough, that's what happened. So we never paid Wally a lot of money. And in fact, he donated his service mostly. And a lot of times we didn't take his advice either, you know, because Prabhupada always took precedence. Well, the flower incident was a famous incident in the history of Australia. And it, it revolved around our Rathiatra festival. The Rathiatra festival, which was held in uh, Australia in 1973. Because Srila Prabhupada was there for Rathiatra the year after, and then this conversation, which is taking place, happened in 75. During that Rathiatra festival, uh, some of the devotees got carried away with their um, gathering of flowers, and one group of devotees took off to the outer suburbs, and uh, they broke into a greenhouse, a professional greenhouse, and they... Uh, volunteered all the flowers from that greenhouse to Lord Jagannath, which wasn't an authorized activity at all. But somehow or other, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of carnations showed up on the morning of Rathiatra Festival. So we used them, and then the police came just before the festival was to begin, and uh, it was almost an ugly scene, and uh, one of the brahmacharis had to be sacrificed for the, <laughs> for the gallows. <laughs> and so he sacrificed his freedom, and he said, I went and you know, stole the flowers, I did it on my own, and uh, so he spent the Rathiatra day in jail. And the Rathiatra festival went on. And we had to pay a fine and everything like that. So everything got resolved a whole year before. So the humor is that the devotees had purchased this new temple, and we wanted to have an elaborate greenhouse for the Tulsi plants. So the devotees who were helping to organize this temple 
weren't aware of what happened on the Rathi after festival the years before. So they were looking around for a greenhouse. So they thought, well, let's ask the guy about his greenhouse. And they were all dressed up like devotees and everything, very earnest. So they knocked on the guy's door, and lo and behold, it was the man who, years before, the devotees had stolen all his flowers. That was like the straw that broke his back. He flipped out. And he started screaming and yelling, and he drove them away. He said, get off of my property, I never want to see you again. So the lawyers had found out about that, and they were all laughing. And it all came up while Prabhupada was explaining how Krishna owns everything. <laughs> so they were all having a good uh, chuckle about that. So in that type of an atmosphere, uh, Prabhupada was conducting these conversations every night. We usually go on for an hour or two hours, and then they would be given prasadam and treated very respectfully. And in this way, Prabhupada said we can establish good relationships with the respectful people of the, of the city. And it actually worked because when we were having all these difficulties with the police and city council in Melbourne, uh, one year the Archbishop of Melbourne came to Srila Prabhupada and the Archbishop was so impressed with Srila Prabhupada that he spoke from the pulpit the next Sunday saying that we should not persecute these Hare Krishna people and we should uh, let them go in peace. And the sermon was reported in the paper, on the Sunday papers, that the Archbishop had made this comment. And lo and behold, the City Council backed off after that. You know, it came out in the paper that the Archbishop of Melbourne had given his stamp of approval to the uh, devotees. So it was, uh, uh, it was a great PR move on Srila Prabhupada's part, even inadvertently. But nothing was inadvertent with Prabhupada. He knew that, you know, Krishna was in control and that he was doing his job spreading Krishna consciousness and uh, everything else was going to just come out perfect. Um, it's going to be very hard uh, to, yes. to, 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 to get to what you're trying to That is to be noted that <clears throat> first thing is that everyone should be convinced or understand clearly <coughs> that everything belongs to God. But they have no conception of God. In his room, there's a chaise lounge, the French kind of seat Prabhupada sat on. So in that room, uh, one morning, I had some duty to ask him something. I can't remember, but he was sitting on that seat. And uh, when I came in, he was in some kind of spiritual uh, experience with his eyes closed, and he seemed to be like hugging someone who I couldn't see. He was like moving his shoulders forward and just feeling these really intense feelings. And then uh, after some time, I didn't know what to do, so I was just sitting there, and then he opened his eyes and looked at me, and yes, and then I, whatever question, something about doing something by a certain time, I can't remember what it was just now, and he just answered, and. And then I paid my basis and left. That was very amazing. There was the two solicitors, and the other guy with the long hair was the photographer that took the ad for the Wrangler shirts, which was that billboard ad that was around the world. The photographer, whose name was Bob Bourne, and he was a personal friend of mine, and he won awards for that one photo. How it came about for him to do the Wrangler ad we had uh, just done the temple up in Burnett Street and the deities have just been all clothed in new clothing and by Barbie had been decorating everything and uh, I organised Bob Bourne to come and take the photos of the deities for, the, for this particular time of their new dress. Um, Bob had the Hasselblad camera which is the one you viewed through the top and he kept on referring to the, the deities as them and it, virtually those. And uh, at one time where he was lining everything up and Barbie was just making sure that everything was in particular position for the photo. And it just so turned out that she walked out of the deity room and I walked out of the temple room where we were discussing something. And within seconds, Bob came out and said she'd moved. 
we said, what are you talking about? He said, she's moved. You have to go and straighten her up. And Rada turned. The deity moved. So but Barbie had to go in and straighten her up again. So from that time on, he never referred to them as them or it. It was always Radha and Krishna. And after that, he wanted to do the photo for the Wrangler ad. One of the nicest engagements I remember was when we went to Tarawara Abbey. It was a Trappist monastery up in Yarra Glen, up the back of Melbourne. And those monks were in silence up until the end of the 60s. So they were very strict, vegetarian. Like at the Franciscan monastery, Prabhupada spoke quite pointedly about not killing which he tended to do around Christian people because thou shalt not kill was the point at which he would enter the engagement with them. And, but at Tarawara he didn't. He spoke in a much more relaxed manner and I never saw him so comfortable among men that weren't actually devotees. And there was a point in, in the evening where he was sitting on a couch and the monks were sitting around him and he actually had his arm over the back of the couch around one of the monks' shoulders virtually and he was sitting up and you know, when Srila Prabhupada was relaxed, he was extremely relaxed, you know, but he had a very regal bearing. And like anyone who has a great regal bearing, when they relax, it's extremely attractive because it's intimate. It's not something that you'd normally get to see. Prabhupada's bearing in public was... Um, impeccable and and I very rarely saw him let that go and just relax and I also saw in that moment how Srila Prabhupada was not sectarian it was always about the principles if the principles were being applied and lived then he would embrace that in whatever form that took. And he had a remarkable way of speaking to that part of everybody. You know, when you read the qualifications of a Vaishnava, always respectful to others. And you read those things and those words, um, you can take them superficially or you can take them very deeply. And in moments like that, I got to see very deeply what something like that really meant, the profound respect for the sincerity of those souls. And these, these monks put on such a feast for us and they went to so much trouble and he was so happy to see that and just to be amongst men who were trying to love God and were following some rules and regulations, I could see that he felt a degree of comfort and affinity that I never witnessed before or since. It was absolutely wonderful. And similarly, one who is not a devotee of God, he has no good work. Because he will hover on the mental platform. There are different platforms. Bodily concept of life, general, and this body. Therefore, my business is to satisfy the senses. This is bodily concept of life. <clears throat> and others, they are thinking, I am not this body, I am mind. Well, they are going on mental speculation, like philosopher, thoughtful man. And above that, <coughs> there is interim class of men practicing some yoga. And spiritual platform is above that. First bodily concept, gross, then mental, then intellectual, then spiritual. <coughs> so this Krishna consciousness movement is on the spiritual platform, above body, mind, and intelligence. But actually we should come to that platform because we are spirit soul. We are neither this body, nor this mind, nor this intelligence. 
So uh, one who is on the platform of spiritual consciousness, and they have got everything, intelligence, proper use of mind, proper use of the body, uh, just like a millionaire, he has got all the uh, low and great position, uh, ten rupees or hundred rupees. He has got all of it. You should see whether you are successful. And what is the standard of success? The standard of success is whether you are pleased God. You read this. Uh, <coughs> Atta Pungbi Dija Sreshta. Atta Pungbi. Atta Pungbi Dija Sreshta. I know that much. Atta Pungbi Dija Sreshta. Parnashram Vigbhajaha Svanus Tisyasya Dharmasya Samsidhya Harito Sanam O best among the twice born, it is therefore concluded that the highest perfection one can achieve by discharging his, pre- his prescribed duties, Dharma, according to caste divisions and order of life, is to plead, please the Lord Hari. That is it. That's it. So, uh, whether by my profession, by my business, by my talent, by my capacity, there are different categories. Whether I have pleased God, then it is it. If you have pleased God by your legal profession, you are in a different dress, it doesn't matter. You are as good as they are whole timely serving God. Because their business is also to please God. Similarly, if you have pleased God, then even by practicing your law, you are as good as the selfish person. That should be the end. Whether I have pleased God with my professional duty or occupational duty, that is the standard. You could assume that whatever religion, if a person was religious, a religion means God. That that should, God is one. That that should aid all religions. Yes. And the more Krishnas there are, mm. the more other religious mm. people might benefit. Yet these According to Srimad Bhagavatam, religion means the law given by God. Just like law means the act given by the state. You cannot manufacture law, I cannot manufacture law. Everything is there. He must be at the same time, although he is hero, he must be generous. Just like Alexander the Great, perhaps you know the story, he arrested one thief. So when he was arrested and he was being judged by Alexander, the thief pleaded, that what is the difference between you and me? You are a great thief, I am a small thief. <laughs> so he, Alexander understood it and got him with it, yes. <laughs> this is generosity. He must agree to the principle. Well, there's another one, the battle. Remember the big battle mm. where the Opposition, what was his name, was on the ground. I told Wally the story that uh, Abhimana was surrounded by the Maharatis. There was no mercy then. So now Ghana was uh, objecting that uh, you, you cannot uh, shoot a man if he gets off his chariot. And Krishna said there was no mercy with Abhimana, so therefore there will be no mercy now. Did what that? Generosity, then. Now what? That is happening. Did for Was that generosity? Or huh? Was that where was no. the generosity? Just <laughs> time as well, surely. There's times <laughs> that is what tactics. Yeah. That is what tactics. 
so he left about 20 people back at his house at Don't. some party. So he's feeling that he must have returned. It's my father-in-law's birthday. Oh. <laughs> and it's my son's ninth birthday. Oh. We decided we're going to have the family. That's nice. Very good. And then my wife said, a couple of nights ago, a couple of nights ago, my wife said, well, Take some blessings from the temple. Well, thank you very much. So Father. we decided to, to, to get all of um, my father-in-law's friends. Uh. He doesn't know yet. Yeah. And I'm supposed to pick him up, you see. You know, I'm supposed to be gone <laughs> half an hour ago. He just thinks it's a family, it's a family, uh, you know, home, you see. But by the time we get home, it's a surprise for him. Yes. But it's very nice. It is a very nice function. The father-in-law and the grandson. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's going to bring some prasadam to you. Give some prasadam for them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We invited everyone over to one, uh, Ugasrava's house one night. We had a big party, and Wally came, and Raymond came, and they, they became very much addicted to prasadam. <laughs> Father-in-law also interested. Well, he was here on Sunday. Oh, yes. He came down on Sunday. So you are right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. You've been most gracious and kind with us. I hope you have a nice trip. Thank you. He's coming back in January, too. Maybe then we can have a longer week. Come Hey, it is a very nice place. I used to stay here, but I've got so many branches, I have to go. Good night. Good night. I think you must be very happy to see what's happened in Melbourne. Yes, I'm very happy. This house is quite suitable for our partners. They looked very hard for a long time. <laughs> yes. They yes. had a lot of difficulty. Oh, yes. This is one of the things that I imagine you know the story, but the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, owned this property. And it was almost by devious means that it was acquired. They, because they, they want didn't to give want to sell direct like that. <laughs>
They were made for the uh, travelling Sankatan bus, as Sabarbati Prabhu was organising at the time. Unfortunately, not being a Brahmin, I wasn't allowed to go and examine big Gornitai, so I really just made it all up, how they had to look. But uh, we just did it in the backyard of the temple. We bought a little bit of paraphernalia for the job, you know, some fire bricks and some old vacuum cleaners to pump a bit of air into the fire. As the vacuum cleaners would melt, we would grab another one and turn it on. And they melted pretty quickly because it was very, very hot. As we were doing this, we had the Rathgarts parked right beside them and there was devotees sitting all over the Rathgarts watching this casting procedure underway as we were melting it and pouring it. They were cast metal and the bronze and the brass and while they were being cast we didn't have any gold so certain of the ladies who were watching it were pulling off their wedding rings and throwing them into the crucible as we were melting down the metal and that was very exciting. Deepak was handling the metal with me. It was something we'd never attempted before we really didn't know where we were going or what we were doing with it but we had a shot at it. Uh, this cast in the making of these deities had transpired must have been shortly after Prabhupada's visit. I imagine Prabhupada would have installed those too if he'd been there at the time. He was keen to make Lord Chaitanya available to everyone. You know, try to please Srila Prabhupada in this way. And uh, it was all by his mercy that any of it was ever achieved, obviously. We certainly weren't going to be able to do anything alone or by ourselves. The original deity was Radha Balava, marble deities that occupied the center altar. And then the year after that, the Jagannath deities were carved for the Rathiyatra, which Srila Prabhupada installed. And then the third year, when Srila Prabhupada opened up the new building, this is when Gornitai was installed. And when Prabhupada installed the Gornitai deities, he named the new temple the Melbourne Mahaprabhu Mandir. We practically outgrew the temple the day we moved in. <laughs> the purchasing of the Melbourne temple was a very big endeavor. It was very difficult for us to come up with the money. Uh, one devotee donated 10,000 Australian dollars, and that was the first deposit. But after that, the rest of it was 180,000 Australian dollars, and that was a lot of money back then. We had a very meager income, just people giving coins and notes on the street for books. and. In those days, we didn't hire people to do things, so devotees, they personally renovated the whole surface of Prabhupada House. They scraped and plastered and filled on ladders and scaffolds all over the building, and the, and the large temple room floor was laid with marble and onyx. And there was very short time, and, and Prabhupada was coming. And they actually arranged Prabhupada's visit to Perth for 10 days because the Melbourne Temple wasn't ready to open. And when Prabhupada arrived, at one stage, uh, Prabhupada, he actually said to, to Madhavisa Prabhu, this temple is too small, why don't you build a bigger temple in the courtyard? And this was a real shock at the time because such an endeavor. And, and I guess we were feeling a bit um, proud that we'd done this. So like some other circumstances, Prabhupada would say something to make us realize it's not so big what you did. Prabhupada uh, sat down. He took off his chudder, he folded it into a neat little square, and he sat down with his back to the wall next to Lord Nityananda. And myself and Dwapiana were then allotted to dress the deities. We're dressing the deities in full view of Prabhupada, who was just a metre away, so we were quite nervous. The Dwapiana reached for some tulsi leaves and also the manjaris because we were growing our own tulsi plants at this stage. And uh, we, um, we placed them on the feet of the deities. Uh, Prabhupada at this stage leaned over and suggested that we don't place the tulsi leaves on the feet of the deities, but rather we place them in between the feet of the deities. So we made this adjustment. We were all heavily sleep deprived. We'd been up for days and nights without sleep. So a lot of us can't remember much about it, but there's a bit of my bald head popping up there. And in fact, I am leaving Kirtan, and um, until I saw the footage I wasn't able to remember what I was doing, but there I am, there's a lean, mean-looking Kormadas playing the Madanga, there's a little bit of a uh, few devotees' heads that I recognise. We were all packed in very close together. There comes the uh, camphor lamp for us to uh, take the prasadam 
and we were dancing and chanting like anything. I remember Sir Barbie was playing Wampers like a devil and um, practically um, busting my eardrums. But we were just uh, on a spiritual uh, high at that point. We were having Prabhupada in our presence. This was the darshan of the first arti ceremony. Prabhupada was doing the arti. We hadn't seen Gornitai before. We were just in a daze. We couldn't believe it was going on. But we did what we had to do. And at the same time, we were watching Prabhupada do the arti. It was all just wonderfully ecstatic. <laughs> One time, Srila Prabhupada was sitting on his Vyasasan and there was a need for somebody to do the Guru Puja in the morning. So I busied myself going about doing the Aarti to Srila Prabhupada. So one thing that really struck me was that Srila Prabhupada was taking a lot of attention about what I was doing and how I was offering and cleansing my hands and doing the whole Aarti. He was always looking over. Normally you would think that somebody with Srila Prabhupada's status who'd been offered arti so many times wouldn't be taking much notice. But as we know, Srila Prabhupada took notice of everything. And one time he said, when somebody had said to Srila Prabhupada, oh, it's no big deal or it's nothing big, Prabhupada said, everything is big for a devotee. There was a time when I dressed the deities. I dressed them very much in the mood of those Kangra paintings from India, you know, the very simple paintings where the actual leela is very strong in the paintings. They're not very realistic in, in the way a Western person would think, but, but I find them much more realistic in terms of the mood. So I remember there was a lot of very delicate white flowers dancing around and, and Krishna had this big turban. And a photograph got sent to Srila Prabhupada and when he saw it, he, he said, um, whoever dressed these deities was directly inspired by Krishna. So Krishna was very kind to me because I had no qualification at all. I still don't. I had no understanding. I mean, there was a lot of much more serious people around that had a much deeper grasp of what was going on than I had. But Krishna was, was very, very kind and Srila Prabhupada always made sure that that knowledge was passed on to me one way or another so that the encouragement and the support was very clear. So when we got to the Melbourne temple, it was very much that way as well. He was very pleased here. That's one thing I, I think should be said very clearly. He publicly praised Madhudvisa Swami in particular for the effort he had put in. And it was a wonderful thing to see because um, he didn't often give praise openly in public like that. That wasn't a common thing. And at that time, Madhavisa, he did a lot to consolidate the chanting of the Maha Mantra in Melbourne. Like all of us, there's times when we can serve very well and then there's times when it's not so easy, you know, and I'm sure there's been a, a fair degree of difficulty along the way, but, but certainly during that period he was able to inspire so many people and Srila Prabhupada was visibly pleased with that. Actually, after the installation, Prabhupada called me up into his room. I was a temple president at that time. And he asked me if... Um, if we'd be able to maintain the three pajaris at all the artis. And um, I told him that with our manpower, we'd probably find it difficult for all the artis. And he said, well, therefore we should have um, Mangalati and um, evening arti with the three pajaris. So we pretty well maintained that right through after that. 
He also asked that we make sure prashadam distribution took place as far and wide as we could from the temple. He said, so what plans have we got to distribute prashadam? We'd only just opened the temple, of course. So I said, well, we're having the Sunday feasts and lunchtime prashadam, and we had a restaurant downtown that we were wanting to expand. Every devotee in Australia had come to the opening of the temple. Prabhupada was not scheduled to visit any other place. Rather, he suggested to Madhavisa that all the devotees come to this one celebration. So not only that, there were parents of devotees, friends of devotees. We had invited all the neighbours and the, uh, the, the local uh, dignitaries in the South Melbourne Council. So the property was overflowing with people. We had even invited the workmen who had helped with the construction and uh, so it became quite a joyous event. There was a large gathering of guests. I think many of them were relatives of the devotees. As I know, my own parents were there. It was wonderful to see them there, as they certainly had no contact as such with Krishna consciousness and never would have. But that was Srila Prabhupada's mercy that he was able to attract everyone. Srila Prabhupada gave a darshan to the devotees. Now, Srila Prabhupada, from what I remember, didn't very often give darshans to the general devotees. So it was a special occasion. We were all called up to his room, and we were all sitting there, and Srila Prabhupada was sitting at his desk. It was quite a casual affair. Well, a loving affair, put it that way. Srila Prabhupada was basking in the association of his disciples, and his disciples were doing the same. At one particular point, a devotee got up. His name is Gopikanta. He was a brahmachari and he'd been to Japan to help collect for the Nam Hada program. So he got up and he stood in a particular way. And everyone else was sitting down, so this is very dramatic. And he's a big person. And he stood with his hands, almost like in a karate style, for emphasis. And he said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I know there are so many things that please you, but I want to know what will please you the most. I mean the most. What will please you the most? So many of us might have been thinking, Srila Prabhupada's going to say, distribute my books. And that's what I was thinking. <laughs> but it really sticks in my mind because Srila Prabhupada didn't say that. Basically, he said, and this is pretty revolutionary for those times, because we could not conceive that there was going to be a time, at least I didn't, when Srila Prabhupada wasn't going to be with us. But he said, understand Srila Bhagavatam, learn Srila Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, and become a guru. Try to deliver everyone in your land, or the world, if not the world in your land. Srila Prabhupada never actually said such a thing to us. <laughs> Of course, in other conversations, Srila Prabhupada said, that doesn't mean that one advertises oneself as a guru. <laughs> Actually, it means become qualified as a guru, which means really to become a perfect disciple. The whole temple was packed out, and I peeked in through the door at the Jagir. I wanted to ask Prabhupada a question. I'd only come up for the day from the country. And I wanted to know if he was like Jesus, if he could save me from birth and death, that kind of thing. So I propped myself in the passageway. And at an opportune moment as he came past, I sort of stood up and blocked his way a little bit. I didn't realise as soon as I stood up, Prabhupada was shorter than me. But then all material conceptions were inappropriate because he was so effulgent and his skin was just like velvet and his eyes are like deep black pools. But Prabhupada stopped and he wanted to give me his attention and he wanted to hear the question. He said, hmm, like this. And it was like really deep, but very soft. The question was irrelevant because of his presence. 
he was the most um, transcendental personality I'd ever met. So I, I just paid my pranams and got out of his way, basically. There'd been a big advertising campaign that the devotees were involved in, the Wrangler Jeans Company. One of the congregation devotees, um, they dressed him up with a dhoti and a blue Wrangler shirt. And the whole idea of the ad, there was a Sangatan party coming right down Burke Street, the main street in Melbourne. He was dressed in his dhoti, but he still had a blue Wrangler denim shirt on. And the caption at the bottom was, um, I'm not going if I can't wear my old Wrangler shirt. And that was in billboards all over the city. So when we were driving Prabhupada out to the airport, we passed one of the billboards and pointed to the billboard and said, Prabhupada, this is one of the ads that we're in. <laughs> and he said, oh, everywhere, they're seeing us everywhere. <laughs> I was working for the national airline Qantas in Sydney and Prabhupada came through, actually on his way back from Melbourne. I had access to the reservation system, so I put the VIP comments in the computer program. And when Prabhupada came through, they looked after him very nicely and... I went over there and offered him some 7-Up or some drink like that and Prabhupada looked at me because I was in my uniform, of course, being a traffic officer there at the airport. So uh, I offered my obeisances in my uniform and I think uh, Prabhupada was uh, a little bit surprised. He said, who is this boy? <laughs> so uh, Shruti Kirti Prabhu said that I was in Melbourne at the uh, events in the last few days. But it was nice, I, I felt very happy to do that. The movements had a lot of ups and downs and devotees have come and gone and life goes on and yet that paradox exists. The people that were touched by Srila Prabhupada, you've only got to scratch the surface and you can see that they're still touched. And um, that's continued for decades after Srila Prabhupada's left this world. When Prabhupada touched us most deeply and spoke to the heart and soul of a person, the self and, and awakens that, that awareness of what the self is and what its function is and what its goal is in this world, those things have never diminished over time. They actually, if anything, gain clarity and the taste deepens and sweetens with age. It's not constrained by a historic dynamic. Certainly history was made, there's no question about that, but the real history that was made was the way Srila Prabhupada touched such remarkably diverse range of people and held them the way he did. Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Prabhupada.